So welcome everyone. This is um, my mastering the curl command line session. Um, and I'm doing this here today, August 31, and I'm streaming it live on Twitch. So hopefully there's an audience there. I'm, uh, of course, uh, as I think you know, I'm Daniel Stenberg. I'm the lead developer of curl. I started the curl project a long time ago. And um, I'm here today. I work for Wolf SSL. I work full time on curl. Uh, I'll get back to that a little bit, but today I'm primarily going to talk about some things. I meant I forgot about this slide, of course. So if just want to mention that I work on curl full time, and th that's possible thanks to the me working for Wolf SSL. We sell support, uh, commercial support to customers who need and want help with curl. So the setup we have today is I'm here. I'm going to talk about curl for a long time. So basically sit back, put your feet up or whatever. This is live stream. We have a chat room here. That's of course not visible um, in, on screen, but uh, this is going to last a while. I have a lot of slides here. I have a lot of content I want to go through. You will see uh, the agenda in, in a few seconds. I'm doing this recorded, of course. That's why uh, most of you are going to see this recorded after the fact. And I just wanted to s mention to the live audience that sure, this is going to go on for a while. So take a pause and, and come back if you feel you have to and you want to. And, and this is a lot of materials I have never previously presented or, or talked about before. I've done a lot of new slides for this. So uh, bear with me if I sort of sometimes might not remember exactly what I was going for. And I'm of course going to do, I'm going to try to, to use the terminal in, in several occasions as well, you know, bring it up and show how to do the command lines live. I, I, I will type, I do the curly command lines and, you know, all, with all my fancy typos and everything. And this is how I intend to spend my uh, next two and a half hours or something. That's because that's my projected time. We'll see uh, later if how far off I am. And of course, again, this is um, recorded, but we're doing it live. So there's a live um, chat here. It's non-visible, but if you're in the chat room, feel free to ask questions and I will try to get it into the um, presentation if, if I can and if I manage to actually monitor the chat. The slides will be available after the fact as well. I if you prefer to see them, they, there are a lot of them, a lot of them. But you might want to, you know, follow along later when you rewatch it or whatever. <coughs> so, this is where I want us to go today. So, starting out, just some words about the project, what, the curl project. What is the, what is the project? What is curl? How did it start and everything? And so from the ground up, I always talk about internet transfers and at least in my family and, and my uh, non-nerdy friends, people don't really know what an internet transfer is. I'm going to try to get, get into that before I start talk about command line basics, how, the sort of the basic fundamentals of command line parts when you use curl. Pretty much I'm going to show you how to use options, how the options are constructed, you know, options, URLs and, and things like that. And then once we have laid the groundwork there, how options work, we're going to go into some of the more basic functionality and how you use those options to do things, upload downloads and all sorts of fun things. And one way of sort of when we have covered the basics, I will go even deeper into some details around how to do TLS and then options around TLS. Uh, there are a lot of different things you can do there, of course. And then a similar thing, a lot of different proxy options, what proxies are, how they work and different options around that. And then um, HTTP being maybe, well, it is the by far most commonly used protocol when you use curl. And I'm going to spend a significant amount of time to talk about uh, how to do curl stuff to play with HTTP and H uh, HTTP features really. Uh, and then by this time, everyone is going to be really tired and fed up with me. But then I'm going to just mention a few details about FTP because FTP is a protocol that stands out a little bit for some, you know, for reasons I'm going to get into. Now, that's a fairly short section. And then 
before we all die uh, uh, by uh, from exhaust exhaustion uh, i'm going to talk a little bit about curl coming up next the future what's going to possibly happen or not so all of that a lot of stuff a lot of slides um take it easy lean back so the curl project um as you can see in the in the lower <laughs> right corner here i i insert a little counter here every once in a while to just remind us that where we are in in this journey so the curl project is actually something that started a long time ago right so it back in november 1996 i found this project called hp get it was uh, not written by me it was written by a brazilian guy called rafael sagula and he had created this he released his, his that first version 0 0.1 in um, november 11 1996 i found it i used it to to do download counts rates that's that was 160 lines of code c code and that taught me that was really easy to do it really small uh, HTTP client in C, HTTP 1.0. Uh, I sent back some patches, uh, Raphael grew tired by, uh, from me, my, my sort of my patches, so he said you can take over maintenance of this tool, so I started, so I became the maintainer, continued working on that, I added more protocols, go for an FTP, uh, and in August 1997 we renamed this tool to URL get instead, because it wasn't just HTTP anymore, it was now Gopher, and then we added FTP as well. So, and then after a long time, we added upload support as well, and we renamed the project again. So in March 1998, we shipped curl for the first time. By then we called it curl version 4.0, because we kept the version numbering from the previous ones. And curl in March 1998, that was 2,400 lines of code, 24 command line options. Two years later, we changed a lot of the internals, you know, remodeled everything so that we could provide the networking stuff as a library instead of, you know, just the command line tool. So now we, re most of the stuff turned into this networking library, and then we made curl just a small wrapper for accessing libcurl from a from a shell, really. So the name. Right, lots of people then ask me. Well, so, what? Why is called curl? But but you know, naming is really hard. How do you? What do you name something? What do you call something? But yes, curl. You know, the previous uh, names I, I mentioned: HTTP GET, URL GET. They were sort of references to protocols and getting things, and they all eventually get things with URLs. So I wanted it to be uh, something with URL in the name, Cli and then the C could be for a client. Um, I also wanted it to be short so that you could type it easily as you would with all Unix command lines, you know, command line uh, tools. You don't want it to be long because it's tedious to type. And I, I wanted it to be pronounceable and an easy word to say in, uh, in many languages, in primarily than in Swedish, my, my language and English. So curl, excellent. It's easy to say, it's easy to spell, it's easy to type. And I also like that you can actually sort of, if you would separate the URL from the C, you could also sort of, you could say it C URL, as it would sort of like the cat command, but for a URL. So instead of a file, it would be a URL, pretty much. Others have done, after the fact, we also found out some other fun uh, ways you could actually maybe uh, spell it out, the, the acronym curl, but those are just, you know, funny ways to, invent new ways to to explain the word <coughs> in c the curl project and uh, of course project is a fun thing to call it because a project usually in most other aspects actually have a you know limited time scope too but the, the curl project is of course an open source project it will never end so we do two primary things in the project we do as i mentioned already the command line tool and the library they do internet transfers as a client so we have a few golden sort of rules that we don't uh, uh, deviate from we only do client side um, networking so they're curl and libcurl they're always client side no server side uh, stuff 
really. And there are or about internet transfers. They're supposed to be upload or download or both. But if they're not strictly upload download, that's probably not uh, curl materials. And of course, it also they should talk about um, an endpoint specified as a URL. And, uh, and then a URL should be a standard or a semi-standard or at least an attempted standard to exist the syntax. Um, you, I could also mention that, of course, all the URL uh, schemes that curl supports, they are, are all actually of the colon slash slash style, right? So hence the colon slash slash for in the logo, because that's all, all the URLs um, that curl supports, they all use colon slash slash. Curl and everything we do is open source. Open source means that everything is there to be used openly shared and distributed by anyone. We also make every discussion, decision, everything held in the open. And um, we do that to as, as much as we can. Curl is MIT licensed. It's not exactly the MIT licensed because someone at some point decided that he should change the edit the license a little bit i did i don't remember why it was stupid but it's so it's not a word for word mit license it's actually slightly edited but it's essentially the same content it, it's short and sweet and this is how it looks if you just um, read all the words it's uh, 200 words or something easy peasy nothing strange the mit style uh, license pretty much you can do whatever you want um, as long as you have this copyright notice somewhere in your product or documentation or something. Um, it's a very, very liberal license. The curl project, we make these projects and it's open source and it means that it is developed by everyone or everyone is in, uh, encouraged and welcome to change, submit bugs and submit features and do anything. I'm the only one around in the project who actually works on this full time. So a lot of people are helping out for different reasons paid by others in different ways so anyone can provide their changes or proposals there's no paperwork we don't have any you don't have to sign any contracts there's no clas no license agreements um, we of course review and test everything that is proposed before we merge and accept them um, but otherwise anyone can participate there's a small team of people who can accept the merge changes it's certainly not just me where I think we're maybe 15 people who, are, who have the rights to do it and, and the ability. We do releases, of course. We have done a lot of releases. So, as I mentioned, the first HTTP GET came in 1996, the first CURL in 1998. So for the last maybe 10, 12 years, we do releases every eight weeks. On Wednesdays, actually. Wednesdays, eight weeks, Wednesday, eight weeks, Wednesday. And sometimes we do them sooner when we need to do a patch release. But we're, we have now, uh, we're looking forward to do our 251st release the next time, actually on September 13. So we've done it a lot of times. We release what's in the master branch at the time, meaning that we don't work on particular features, uh, sort of, or rather we don't wait for features to get merged to do releases. We release on the clock and whatever is done then we release. And so that is how we how we work really. And that's why we also do this calendar based release. So we have this cycle, eight week release cycle. If you look at the right side, um, that's the release Wednesday. And then we go down because after the release, we have a 10 day cool down period during which we don't merge features. We don't rock the boat. We might merge bug fixes. We might do patch releases. And then after 10 days after that release, it's a Saturday we open the feature window and we allow feature we, uh, features to get uh, merged for three weeks, 21, 21 days, and then it's Saturday again. Then we close the feature window, we have 25 days of feature freeze, and then we do a release. And then we start over, over and over and over and over, and it never ends, and this is the schedule we stick to. We also don't break existing functionality, right? So we have, if we have shipped features, we have shipped options, we have shipped something, it started to work at some version, we keep it working like that. We don't break it ever, really. 
I, I could possibly say that of course there's some asterisks there uh, in in the small print so sometimes it does happen due to bugs or due to other unforeseen circumstances but we really we make the utmost sort of we put in a lot of effort and uh, make make it really this is something we'd really work hard to live up to everything this is on github we work and sort of we go by the github model really so if you want to participate in the in the project you and you've done that with other github uh, projects you know how to do it you submit issues when you have a problem if we do pull requests you basically go to github you do you fork the repository and you do your changes uh, and you submit the pull request easy pc low low friction low bar <clears throat> so basically we do our best to make sure that it is easy to participate and and easy to contribute when you have something and there's a lot of documentation so if you want to learn more I'm, I'm going to dig into a lot of things today but you will of course feel that i'm not going through it enough but we have a lot of documentation so of course you can just start with a man page man curl also built into the tool itself curl dash dash manual you can go to the web page which is which is always the latest version of the man page uh, rendered uh, online then so if we have corrected the man page since your version this is the more up-to-date one and then there's this book everything curl which is uh, online that's the that's the image here that's the front of it um that, that's a, I, that's more than a hundred thousand words in that thing now it's a lot of words a lot of documentation and of course the more um you do curl dash dash help to get a, um, suggestions of what options to use and if if that is not enough there are of course ways for you to ask for help because of course there's a huge community of people using curl people who know to use curl and others who are asking for help and we can all help out each other right so we're an old project we do things by mailing lists and we have done that since yeah since the 90s so we have primarily have this then the the curl users mailing list focused to command line tool questions command line tool users uh, it's there on lists.hacks.se curl users and there's another one called curl library which is more focused on the library than development debugging sort of more architectural stuff more source more development and it's also on the same site and of course if you rather go with just discussing discussing things that's that aren't really bugs but you don't want to go with mailing lists you can use the discussion feature on the github project on, on the github project repository thing curl slash curl blah 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 <clears throat> and if you want to pay for help because you run this uh, you do this as a part of a business uh, we're here for you to help you as well so just get in contact with wolf ssl and we will help you immediately <clears throat> so basically curl then this is what the curl project has then accomplished during all this time we support a busload of stuff that's why i often use that swiss army knife uh, symbol or toy image of curl because it has so many different toggles and, and things that you can levers and things to do and curl actually literally runs everywhere you can of course use it on linux and uh, all the links distros it's default in windows it's default on mac you can run it on all those fun bsds older legacy systems vms you can all, on anything i actually have this collection of operating systems where people have mentioned that they use curl on or ever ran curl on and it's this amazing set of 92 different operating systems many of them you know we never knew existed as an operating system but uh, it's an amazing number of them and of course all of this as i said it's a lot of people helping out the the top blue graph uh, plot here shows the number of committers in the project since the beginning soon reaching 1200 committers being someone who has authored code or a part of something that has been merged into git and just counting people who have contributed that number is uh, uh, approaching 3000 soon 
that also then include people uh, that includes people who have reported bugs and so on number of lines of code uh, is a fascinating growth as you can see in 1998 2000 lines of code and now 160,000 lines of code so 80 times growth roughly in 25 years or so so the project has really then come to this point where we count roughly maybe 20 billion installations worldwide uh, it's really really hard to know it's a guesstimate at best but it's it's everywhere and yet of course the simplicity of the tool and really i think the straightforwardness of the api has made of course it makes it simple to it looks simple it's easy to think that you can sort of you know re-implement this in a few days and uh, people keep thinking that but i really i really want to say that one of our goals with curl has always been to make sure that everything that worked before still works right so even if you still use this um uh, i mean you used it 10 years ago you use it today it still works the same it still looks the same it, you in, in some cases you don't see the development because it looks the same it works the same to a large extent anyway <coughs> that's just sort of yeah that's the curl project that's what we do a small project lots of people lots of installations we do internet transfers and what is an internet transfer this is so fun because i, w I just want all of us or any reader here to be to sort of follow along what, what we're talking about here because an internet transfer is you know uh first we're talking always we talk when we talk about curl there's a client and there's a server the server is the remote machine somewhere curl is the client we're here basically so we connect to the client and uh, no, sorry, sorry the curl client connects to a server somewhere else usually somewhere remote perhaps to do an internet transfer so we send data it's a stream of data to the server or from the server that's the that's the internet transfer right um, and if we get data from the server it's a download if you send data to the server it's an upload it's not that strange but um, uh, a little bit of what i got into before also that the data can be anything and curl doesn't really know so you know text images maps code film sound it, curl doesn't know and doesn't care uh, everything it sends it just sends it because the the user asks it, curl to get the data or send the data it doesn't know what the data is so and then i use this little image here to show <laughs> my view of what a uh, transfer is and i i, I also want to introduce this tiny images is but i'm going to uh, reuse these icons uh, in some other slides as well so the, the the bottom thing here the client that's the curl right that's the curl logo it doesn't have to be a laptop of course it could also be a phone a car a fridge a printer um and it, it usually is or a television set or a game console or anything that runs curl but we're talking curl command line today so command lines usually run by a computer thing so the laptop is a good symbol for that and it uploads things to the server i should I show that as a cloud because the servers are sometimes in the cloud right downloads things from the cloud down to the computer that's a download so <laughs> curl then supports a lot of protocols right uh, if counting them like this there um, sometimes you can count them to as 28 if you separate the s versions from the non s versions and they all do uploads or downloads or both or or, or one of them in in this fun combination it doesn't really matter i just want to show you that there's a mix some of them don't do uploads some of them don't do downloads and, and, and things like that there's a telnet here on line four it doesn't really do either because it's a weird mishmash of things but let's figure out about that right now uh, I just wanted to mention that there's this mix upload download upload sending things up to the server download getting things down from the server and all of these protocols as you can see there's a, a lot of different things here with that s in parenthesis at the end s being for secure and that is of course for the secure protocols authenticated versus unauthenticated protocols when curl started there were basically no authenticated protocols and over the time we pretty much all go to more and more authenticated protocols and of course we all want and uh, emphasize and encourage everyone to use authenticated protocols and that means using tls or ssh as the sort of the underlying protocol because authentication 
well, yeah, exactly. That's all of these S protocols and SCP and SFTP. Um, and when you do that, of course, don't switch it off with the insecure option. Curl provides this option that tell, that says, sure, go ahead, run it insecurely. But if you do it insecurely, yeah, that's insecure. Don't do that. It's dash K in the, in the shorter version, but we really, really strongly um, suggest you never do that. Because if you use unauthenticated transfers, like, you know, HTTP without the S, it can be eavesdropped and it can be tampered with. And um, curl or the user using curl won't be able to tell when that is happening. Um, it's also then easily attacked in different ways. So we really should avoid it. We tr should try to use authenticated protocols as much as possible, TLS or SSS, um, SSH powered protocols. So that is, um, that is internet transfers. <clears throat> right, so now already on slide 33, so that's 20% uh, in after half an hour. Jesus, I need to speed this up. Um, here we go. So there's a command line. Cur the curl is a command line tool, right? Um, how do you use a command line tool? I, the command line, of course, when, when we started this, command line tools were perhaps more commonly used and a little bit more like every day. And then over time, we use it less and less. But curl is still a command line tool. And that's it's a very powerful command line tool. So of course, first you have different ways to specify options to the command line tool. You can um, do a short option, dash capital V, for example. That's just, you know, minus and a, a letter. That's how you pr uh, spell it, short option. There are a lot, basically all the letters, both lowercase and uppercase are already used and several digits. So there are a lot of short options. You can specify long options. They start with two dashes, dash dash version, for example. There are uh, all the short options also have a long uh, version of the same options. You, so that capital V in the short version is called the dash dash version in the long version. So there's always the long version. There's sometimes the short version. All the long versions start with two dashes. All the short versions start with one dash. Eh, pretty simple. Um, some of the options, or a lot of them actually, are just Boolean. You just put them there, it's sort of, you know, it's enabling this. Here's an example, the path as is option. It's an, it switches it on, you know, it's like a light switch. We switch on the path as is. We want curl to do path as is, use this option. And then you can do, uh, some, some of the options are not Boolean, they take arguments. Like, I want to store the output somewhere. Then we have this dash dash output option and a space in between and then the, the output, the argument to the option. In this case, store.html being the argument to the output option. Yeah, you, you follow along. If you want to do them with spaces, you usually have to do them with uh, double quotes around them because otherwise the shell the, will uh, do something else for you. And when it comes to quotes around this, um, I, I, I think I will use double quotes mostly here in my examples because that works better also on Windows and Linux, but they're not fully equivalent, of course. So, um, but that's more of a shell thing. So I encourage you to, to read up on the differences between double quotes and single quotes. If you're on non Windows shells and if you're on Windows, don't use shell uh, single quotes because they won't work. Uh, and of course, all those n uh, Boolean options like the path as is, you can sort of switch it off again by prefixing the option name with dash dash, with the no instead. So dash dash no path as is, is, you know, switching off the light again, pretty much. So all the long Boolean options are like that. And, and if they're Boolean or not, it's not visible in the name, you have to actually read the man page to figure that out. And of course, all these options are usually, you know, standalone. They just c change some things. So if you if you want to change more things, you add more options. So you can add a lot of options on off on off different arguments. So this basically makes it a crazy amount of combinations when you add all of these options. And there are many options to select from. And you know, you can read the documentation and find it out for yourself, but there's a lot. And the availability of which particular versions will depend on, sorry, the which particular options that are available will depend on uh, uh, your particular version that you have installed because we keep adding, 
um, new command line options all the time. We add them at the rate at about 10 per year. So yes, today we have, at, when I'm talking to you today, we actually have 257 op command line options. Uh, if you wait a little longer, we will have more. So sure, and depending then on which particular release you go with, you will have a different amount, uh, a different um, set of options available. And I just have to say that the, this, it's an error on this slide. So yes, that var variable in write out, it doesn't exist path as is, I don't know, it's a mistake in there. Uh, mistakes are fun. Uh, okay, so availability will depend on version and it will depend on particular build because you, different builds can you can select to enable different things and they will run on different platforms and they will also use different third party libraries. So, you know, if you go with curl on different places, it might work slightly differently depending on different things. They all are there, so they should be possible to have there, but you know, you know. And as I said, the number of options, command line options in curl have increased over the time. So it started out 24 in, in 1998, we have 257 today. It's, it's not a good thing to have a lot of options, but um, we add them because we have features that we want to provide. So URLs, curl works with URLs, right? I mentioned, see the client for URLs. So th this is a typical, this is not a typical URL, but this is a URL with a lot of different components. And I've used sort of change some colors to make sort of highlight the different components of a URL. The URL that curl works with is specified by the standard called RFC 3986. And strictly speaking, it's a slightly patched version of that. But anyway, that's our guide here is this RFC that says how a uh, URL or a URI really should work. Okay, so basically, for example, you don't use a space anywhere in the URL because a URL cannot have a space, you use percent %20 instead. And as a special thing, curl can work with URLs without schemes. That's not really a URL anymore because a URL has to have a scheme, but curl still supports it. So basically it means that you, if you can, for example, just provide a host name and just that host name, curl will just, and then just guess what kind of scheme you meant, which usually means it guesses HTTP. And of course, it, uh, you can provide a user and password in the, in the URL there. So if you do that, you have to remember to URL encode them. If you have some funny letters in there, for example, and the host name, as you can see in, in the example up there, it says at host. That's the host name that you want to connect to. That's the server. The name of the server could be name, like uh, just uh, ASCII letters, or it could be an uh, international domain name. It can be an IPv4 address, or it can be an IPv6 address, like this, right? The very simple example. Uh, here's a, the most basic URL you can imagine, example.com, HTTPS colon slash slash example.com or it could be you know they could have the IDA in and the name this is a I really cannot pronounce this but this is a genuine Taiwanese uh, domain name it's an IDN of course so curl will understand this and convert it internally to to be able to work with it and it works fine or it could you could specify the IPv4 numerical address or you can just specify the IPv6 numerical address to the target server curl of course supports all that if you would leave out the scheme part, the name colon slash slash from all of these examples, curl would then guess what you meant. In most cases, it guesses HTTP. Um, there, anything that is not an option is a URL. So if you don't start with a dash or a dash dash, right? So if, if it's not an, uh, an option, it is a URL, meaning that's the only thing you can provide to curl, right? Options and URLs, options and URLs. There's nothing else you can provide. Options and URLs. Um, you just select which, well, you can also select to not provide anything at all. Just provide the curl command line. Like uh, if you go like this and let me pop up the, the terminal here. So here's the terminal, right? So if I, if I enter curl, no options at all. 
yeah right so that's that's the the most bare minimum right so the the next bare minimum might be to go with curl localhost again no scheme it'll guess what it is it will guess http so it'll connect to my server on the host, host name called localhost and yep it downloaded http spewed it out on the terminal yep or you can as i said the most basic things of course um, add a, a an option like that one which the, or the longer version which is called version so easy peasy just that's sort of just the basic command line parser and url thing when you talk about port numbers of course f when you talk about urls you provide a port number a port number is a 60-bit number so it's from 0 to 65535 in most cases you don't specify which port number it is because uh, let me hide the terminal it sits there and in the way uh, sorry uh, <laughs> so usually you just provide this the scheme name right so curl knows what port number it, it will use it uses the default one so you can set it in the url uh, like this this goes this will speak https to port 8080 at the example.com server ah, yeah or you can you know provide it with ipv6 address easy so but I, I just want to emphasize then that I said that URLs in curl works with this RFC 3986 style of URLs, and that is not necessarily always the case with URLs, right? And sorry, uh, with browsers, and in particularly not with browsers, you know, the address field in browsers. So if you go to your browser and you add stuff in the address bar in there, that's not necessarily exactly the same standard for URLs. Um, I'm not going to get into that in many more details. I'm just want to make you aware that there might be some differences and it could be uh, problematic sometimes. The, U the browsers have their own URL standard that they follow, which is not the same as the one Carl works with. And it's a bit of a sad situation, but the reality is that there really is no good global URL standard anymore. It hasn't existed for, for a long time. So there will be times when you know we run into the problems where when when one tool meant something and the other tool meant did something else with exactly the same url anyway so you provide options and urls to curl right curl and the number of options and number of urls any amount of urls <laughs> yes it really means there's no limit to the number of urls you can provide to curl uh, it might be a bit impractical to i mean at some point but it's not up to curl to set that limit so you can yeah, you can provide however many you just manage to do. Um, so that also means, but when you provide a lot of them or just two of them, every one of those provided URLs on the command line, they need a place to put the output, right? If you want to get one URL and then another URL, they need to end up somewhere like this. Um, this example here, I will show you first a command line example. So it provides two URLs. You see one is example.com slash file.at and the other one is curl.se slash file2. Um, so um, you need two dash O options. The dash lowercase O is for output file name, right? So as you can see, there are two of them um, because there are two URLs. Or you can, I mean, the order of them is not important either, right? So you could put them in a different order, but they still correlate to the same so the first url gets the first dash o the second url gets the second dash o uh, so you can mix a match the order doesn't matter but the well the order doesn't matter because the second url will get the second dash o but you mean you can mix them like this or like this this is a different option this is the uppercase o which saves the, uh, the url according to the file name part of the url so the first uh, example.com slash file one will be saved as file one and the curl.se slash file two will be saved as file two. Or you can just, you know, send it everything out and redirect with the shell redirect, which means that both of both contents from both of these files will get into the same output, like the one called everything here. It's not that strange. You can also use it if you want to use remote name all. It basically sets the dash capital O automatically for all the URLs on, on the command lines. So you can actually use one of that and then a lot of URLs and it'll do the same for all of them. 
so you can that's sort of you need to provide options for every url that you transfer or you will get them on the standard out usually standard out is not what you want sometimes it is you decide so there's a query part in the url as well as you can see the query part is the little thing that comes after the question mark right um before the fragment part the fragment part is never sent over the network at all so we can usually um, well often we don't talk about the fragment part when we speak curl because it's not sent over the wire anyway so uh, queries or the query part they're often created like name value pairs separated by ampersands um, it's typoed uh, okay so basically you provide a set of pairs right name is daniel tool is curl age is old uh, with a separation like that so this is it's not you don't have to do that but it's a very common thing to do it's more or less of a sort of a semi-standard de facto thing this is how basically a huge part of uh, the internet or the web is made right and uh, you can in curl then has this fancy option called dash dash url query that will add one of those pairs to the query part of the url so you can do name equals daniel and it will add that to the query part in the url or you can add a whole range of them and they will add, and curl will add them automatically to the query part which helps you create that particular url you need to work with and it then gets uh, url encoded suitably to work correctly url encoded be meaning then that it encodes it with a character set and percent encodes it if it needs to if you if it would contain some other funky letters that otherwise couldn't work in a url and you can also read contents from a file and so on so it helps you create that query if you want to do query things uh, in your script for example like this if you go to example.com but you want to add a query that says uh, name is Daniel Stenberg and, and I used this example just because it has a space in there so the space will be URL encoded um, I also then want to mention talking about URLs um, this is not curl at all this is a companion tool to curl that we created earlier this year It's called Truerl it is a tool that parses and man manipulates um, URLs um, and it's it's there to help you create fiddle update extract you know manage urls you can for example if you have a url but you want to change the host name you have a url but you want to sort of what is the new url if this url would redirect to this uh, relative url or why not change the port number url how would it become done basically it is helper for your shell scripts to let you fiddle with URLs without parsing understanding URLs yourself. This tool understands and, and manipulates the URLs for you. You can also, uh, like things, add stuff to the query string. Again, just as, as I mentioned, this particular tool can do that as well. Or you can make it output as a JSON object, or you can extract particular part from the query string. P super handy when you write scripts or command lines when you want to uh, in interact or sort of manipulate update extract things from urls um, yeah i just wanted to mention that so you keep that in mind try it out at some point when curl works with urls it supports this concept we called globbing i don't know really if this is a really good term but we call it globbing and globbing here means that uh, you can provide ranges and lists Sort of embedded in the URL, primarily basically like this. Uh, here's a, here's a range, right? One to one hundred. So it means that instead of you writing this almost the same URL, you know, a hundred times and just changing a number, you can use this uh, range instead within the URL. Or, or you can even have it zero prefixed. You can make it uh, letters like A to Z, or you can also even make it, you know, do jumps. So one to a hundred with a take steps by 10 at a time and you can even do that steps with the letters um, and then of course you can do lists which is then you, as you can see this is using braces instead and you have comma separated so one two three uh, or weak uh, you know like that 
and and uh, you can combine them so you can for example use a list and a range and you can use these funny hash on the numbers to refer back to the name used in that particular glob part so in this case this will get what uh, 66 different uh, urls for you download them in different uh, jpeg file names uh, in your target directory barum uh, kind of handy when you know that you have files or remote files remote resources that follow this various kind of patterns and you want to get them and i want to just emphasize that then th these of course can then do a ridiculous amount of uh, you know variations if you combine them in in endless uh, and huge ranges so yes you can do a lot of them and you can um since then, th this then uses these um, braces and brackets as a sort of magic letters. You can't use them as easily in URLs, of course. And this, originally, you could never use. They were pr they are sort of reserved characters in URLs, so they couldn't be used. So that's why I used them originally when I designed this feature. Years later, uh, others have um, decided to go differently. So sometimes you will see URLs using these letters, and then you might want to go with glob off so that you can then curl will accept those letters as is in URLs, even though they are strictly speaking not supported. And if you provide a lot of URLs, maybe you don't want them to be done serially, right? The default way for curl to get URLs is one by one by one by one by one, you know, go through the list of provided URLs one at a time. Um, but if you if you provide the uppercase Z the, or dash dash parallel, it will do them in parallel up to 50 at a time. By default, it'll do 50 at a time. So you, if you provide more than 50, it, it will put the, the rest in a queue until the first is uh, done. Then we'll put, it will you know, pull from the queue to keep 50 alive uh, all the time until there's less than 50 left to do. And you can also change that. Parallel max is the option to change to 50. You can go up to, I think 300 is max. Uh, it's capped because it, of in most cases you it causes problems in your uh, system when you go up a certain level let's ignore that for now uh, and it works um, both up and down of course and uh, you can also sort of tweak it a little bit and you could go and say you prefer uh, multiplexing or not multiplexing by saying i'd rather go multiplexing or not multiplexing by using this parallel immediate which sort of changes the priorities for curl on how to do things and you can do them in both directions. It's really handy if you if you have a lot of different downloads and in particular, if they're independent of each other, why not get them all at the same time? So when you want to list which options you have available to use, you use dash dash help. It will list your most important ones, I think, from, from sort of to start with like this. Here's, here's my output from before. Let's clear that. So if I do curl with typos and help, yep, these are the ones that um, we, for some reason, consider the most important or maybe the most frequently ones, uh, frequently used ones. So yeah, you can see those. Uh, that's uh, not a too intimidating <laughs> list or a large list, but you can also do then help category to get help or a list of options for a particular category. So if you would do um, it also says so here on the screen, right? So if you would use help category, you would see the categories that exist. So you can, you, if we go help category, it will show us a lot of different categories that that are uh, available for us to, to list options for. So if we, let's say we want to get options, we want to learn more about file system output options. We would go help output not too many there either right so um, that's that's how you get um, options so without getting everything but if you want to do get everything you can also do help all which of course um, is going to be a really big list so if i scroll up it looks like this these are uh, this is the one the version i'm using here has uh, does not have 257 options i i think this ha this is 254 options but who's counting um and of course 
curl dash dash manual is a way to get to the to the manual. Basically, you do manual, and you can pipe it to something like less, for example, handy. And here is here here is the man page, and now I can read about it. And you and then you know here 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 comes the option. So append AWS blah blah blah. Of course, to make this really convenient, I would search for the options using something. So um, going further, if providing everything on the command line is not good enough for you, and it's sometimes it's not really convenient, you know, those super long command lines, sometimes even some systems even have limited command line length, so you might run into the maximum command line length because you have uh, one bazillion number of URLs and options and everything, so that it doesn't really fit on the command line. Then you can do these what we call config files, basically putting a lot of config files, uh, config, uh, sorry, con command lines into a file. And then you just provide one option and its argument per line in a text file. There's the default one in your home directory. Um, and you use it, otherwise you can use it just dash capital K or dash dash config in a file. And then that file will be read and it will read command line options from that file. And you can of course also then read it from standard input if you want to pipe that into curl and have it read from that. And that, I, I know sometimes people then generate those config files and they can be huge then of course. You can put, in, put, it, put whatever you want in there. And that there's now a 10 megabyte line limit in, in this config file. So you can, you can put in a lot. And there's no limit to the size of the config file either. So it can just, or maybe there's a, I, I, no, yeah, you can, um, there is some limit, but you can at least put uh, a lot of stuff in there without running into problems. And I just want to then go come. Sometimes, of course, when you want to do some things, you provide passwords to curl. And passwords, credentials in general, will, of course, sometimes be a little bit sensitive. You provide dash u, name, colon, password. Uh, when you want to do, you want to, well, provide your credentials so that you get that resource that you want to because it's password protected. Uh, there's also this other uh, .NET RC file that I'm going to mention in a second. And you can provide passwords in config files because, you know, as I said, there are command lines in a file, right? So you can put a dash u in one of those. But you need to remember that, for example, there's a local leakage in that if others are running, if you have a multi-user system, there will be other users on your system and they might uh, do a process listing, right? They could do PS or whatever it's called on your system and see your command lines may be switch, uh, you know, passing by in the process list. That process list then might contain curl dash u and your password. You really need to be aware of that. Curl tries to hide them, but it doesn't always succeed. And there's always sort of a, a risk that it leaks in there anyway. And of course, when you're using networking, which you do with curl typically, right? The, there's also this that you might will uh, send the credentials over the network. And if you're then using unauthenticated network protocols, the passwords will, will be sent in the clear, right? So anyone who is on the network, can snoop on the network, can then perhaps see your password fly by and steal it from you and abuse it in whatever ways. And there's also this, just as a sort of, you know, heads up, remember that if you show curl logging, tracing, debugging outputs, they might also contain credentials. So Remember, um, keep keep uh, track of your your credentials and make sure that you use authenticated protocols always and uh, don't leak your your secrets. When you download stuff, and in particular when you transfer things that are somewhat large, it's it's usually handy, sometimes handy to do progress meters so that you you know you see that something is happening and you can figure out how long time you have to wait until it's done. So unless you use this dash s, dash s silent, or this uh, no progress meter options. Curl will show you. This is a download uh, in progress, and it shows percent of the transfer uh, in percent and in total amount of data, how much it has received, what's the average download speed, the upload speed, the total amount of time that it estimates, it estimates that the transfer will take, how long it has been going on, 
four seconds in this case and how long time it's left four hours for the one minutes and 39 seconds it's a slow transfer and the current speed 9287 bytes in this case which then of course is a, a, a rather slow transfer nowadays so this is how it will show them of course um, by default if you download a file if you choose to instead use this dash pound sign hash sign whatever it's called the progress bar option you will instead get this progress bar thing that will go from you know up to 100 percent and then you're done if you uh, instead do parallel transfers then of course these uh, progress meters don't really work like that yeah, I should mention that these the units up there, they are in bytes unless there's a suffix. There will be suffixes if they go, uh, it will be kilobyte, K for kil kilobytes, M for megabytes, G for gigabytes, and there will be P for petabytes and so on. So, on. so depending on your speed, it will sort of reduce the accuracy because it will always only use five character width in, in the that progress meters uh, progress meter above so and, and when the same thing goes here here's another example this is a transfer two transfers in parallel and it, in in this case it has downloaded 12 percent of them they have downloaded 34.5 gigabyte at the speed of 3903 megabytes per second and it's taken nine seconds so far um when it comes to m parallel transfers there's uh, it's harder for curl to sometimes know uh, the total expected time and the total expected amount because it depends on what it knows about all the transfer and uh, usually what it doesn't know about all the transfers at that particular moment in time anyway so it, it shows a completely different progress meter when you do them in parallel because it needs to show one line of data for uh, potentially a lot of parallel transfers another little fancy thing to remember is that i mentioned that all the urls need their output options right and basically um there's a lot of um there's a lot of things in the curl command line to tool that sort of adds stuff up and then works on them which means that sometimes you need to put in a next that says stop it work on this what you got and then we reset everything and start over on the command line and i'll show you a, a, a pretty good example so um for example if you wanted to add headers to a request i i will sort of i will get into exactly what that means later but like in this case uh, we can just see that it uses the dash capital H option twice here header one header two and there are two URLs in this case it will actually add both headers to the request and then send that request to both URLs so both URLs will get both headers that's what the dash uh, capital H option does that what it means but what if you want to send the first header to the first url and the second header to the second url only one to each and different to each then you need the dash dash next option because it resets the parser so it then it just adds the first one to the first one reset create a new set of headers to the second one this is uh, this is a very powerful and and uh, usually you can forget about it but if you want to do lots of things on the same command line this is also a savior for you so um let's take a little sort of deep breath that's um that's a third of the presentation in one hour so <clears throat> pretty good now i think we got into the basics how to use the command line options urls parallels um and a little things about downloads and stuff and now we're going to get into more more stuff how to do things with curl now we understand the options and stuff and now i'm going to tell you more about particular options and, and fancy things we want to do with options i already showed you curl dash capital v or dash dash version that's how you get to know the version of the particular curl you have installed right curl dash v i use a different colors here on the different lines just to highlight a little bit um, to make you see them better the, the first line 
curl dash v. The first line there is a version number, curl version number, the platform it's built for, the lib curl version number, usually the same. If they're not the same, that's usually a sign of something weird. Uh, and then a lot of different components that is used in this lib curl and their versions. So as you can see, OpenSSL, Zlib, Brotly, ZStandard, LibIDN2, LibPSL, a lot of that just tells the reader uh, about version numbers of, of, of components in this curl tool. There's a release date that's, oh, we can see that yeah, it's a fairly recent version, right? From July this year, it's uh, a little bit over a month old, so it's fresh. Then what kind of protocols? Actually, these are URL schemes. So what kind of protocols does this version, your installation of curl support? Uh, a bunch of them we can see here, dict file, FTP, FTPS, go for go first, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then maybe the, the most interesting one in many cases is this fourth line called features. These are just names, tags basically for different features that curl can have or maybe does not have. It all depends on your version, your build and your third party libraries and, and so on. So these ones will differ greatly depending on what kind of, what build you're running, what platform you're on, what version of curl you have. So, but usually they, they when you have problems, for example, and you submit an issue uh, to us, we will often ask you for the curl dash V output because it contains all of this. So it hints, it gives a lot of details and uh, information about the particular curl installation that you use or run. When you use curl, it does a lot of things internal, of course, and then we provide this verbose option, dash dash verbose or dash v, just to help. It's, yeah, it makes the transfer, the operation verbose. It speaks more, it tells more about what is, what is going on, what does it do when it does what it does, right? So by doing that, uh, we can get more information. It usually, when things don't go the way you want them to, don't go the way you expected them to, you add the dash V. And adding more makes no difference. I know a lot of people like that and they use that because a lot of other tools in the world, they actually you know add more verbosity the more number of Vs you add. But for curl, it doesn't matter. You can add how <laughs> many ever you want because it's a Boolean. It will just add a sort of switch it on many times. So it doesn't matter if you switch it on many more times, it'll just be switched on. Um, and then we have, you can, if dash V is not enough verbose, there's also these trace ASCII and trace options. I'll show them in a second. So they will just then make the even more uh, helpful output descriptions available to you. Then we also provide this trace time option, which pref then makes a prefix to all lines with a time code so that you can, that's for example, is good to see, is there a particular thing in time that takes time or how fast are things or whatever. <coughs> Um, and then re a, a, a recent newcomer in the family is the trace IDs. That's also another prefix to the verbose output lines that outputs the prefix for the transfer ID and connection ID to help you identify which transfer and which connection are different uh, verbose logging lines concerning. Try them out. You'll see they, they're a particular, the trace IDs are particularly good when you do parallel transfers. Trace time is particularly good when you want to identify what in a so certain procedure is taking a lot of time uh, or is not taking a lot of time and so on. <clears throat> and again, be careful when you share these logs because sometimes they contain secrets. It doesn't have to be only credentials. It could also be server names or port numbers or content that you s transported uh, with curl when you did this. So when you want to do trace, you basically do this. Here's an example. This makes an HTTP post sending the three bytes MOO as a cow, moo to this server called curl.se that uh, I happen to uh, know about. <coughs> so this is how it looks like when you start out. So you add dash dash trace and do you see this as tr dash dash trace and the dash, it means sends the output to standard out instead of to a particular file. You can also save it to a file if you prefer. Usually saving it to a file is better because then you can sort of inspect it after the fact and you know scroll around easier. 
but as you can see here it starts out do do transfer a lot of details a lot of tls and ssl data certificate information alpn negotiations details from the certificate and it goes on to details in this case it negotiated http2 we get to see the http2 headers even the pseudo headers in http2 and then we can see the actual um, HTTP requests being sent to the server and then we can see the server responding and we can see bytes getting read as they uh, from the server as curl receives them and blah 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 and then here uh, finally we get content from the server so this is html then from this server curl.se so a lot of things you get to see and, and, and this can of course be very verbose at times if that is not enough we have some other fun uh, fun option here for you and that's the write out option it basically helps you output information after a transfer is done i'm in the way i want to i wanted to do this um so by providing this option you also ask for what particular information you want output after the transfer uh, in my previous example, when I used that dash D moo, that was a post, it was a HTTP post with the data moo, three bytes. Um, maybe I wasn't quite clear on that. Anyway, so if you want to have information from a transfer after the transfer is done, you use this dash W or dash dash write out. And in this case, you know, it's a formatted string. So this particular string is not really interesting, but it has variables in this string that you can use to output. There are a lot of variables. You can then read that string, for example, from a file, or you can get it from standard input if you want to. And in that formatted string, there are over 50 different variables and you can use them like this, for example, if you want to output the content type from the response or the response code from a server or whatever, there are as I said, there are li lots of different variables here. So as you can see, the, the variables are accessed with this percentage and braces around the variable name. And then you just go ahead and, and output that. And you can output that to a standard out, standard error. And you can also, recent, since uh, very recently at least, output that to a file as well. So basically it provides a lot of data from the transfer f for you to output in case um, you need that, you want that in your scripting or your results or whatever. There's also this feature in, in, in here to output particular response header content. So for example, if you want to get this, you know, if you get a response and it says server colon Apache 2.4, that, that's, uh, that's content in the server he response header. And there's usually also a date response header, for example. And then here's a write out string that shows, that outputs the server header field and the date header field if in case just in case that's what you wanted and you should look it up because there are many useful and, and fun variables here and by the time you i mean i'm sure we will add more variables and more information to this over time because this is a really handy and, and convenient way to get information and extract stuff from the previous transfer um, when you use multiple URLs with curl, curl always tries to use what we call persistent connections. It means that it will keep connections alive as much as possible. And what does alive mean? It means that it doesn't close them prematurely. It doesn't close them easily, actually. It just tries to keep them alive. So it, once it has set up, set up a connection, it tries to keep the connection alive, keep the connection there in case you need it again. Um, so if we do repeated transfers that uses the same host name and other conditions, we can reuse the same connection. This is, a, of course, a performance boost, quite significant one, because setting up a connection can be quite costly in, in CPU and time and everything. And why, if you have the connection already there, it's much, much faster. So <clears throat> a connection can be reused and if it uses the same scheme, host name and port number and other conditions too actually. But I just wanted to emphasize that it's not based on IP address, it's based on host name, not IP address. Because if you then want to use the same name again, we remember, oh, we already have a connection to this name, not the address, because then you can skip the entire name resolving uh, part. 
And of course, when, when curl the tool exits, it cannot keep any connections alive. So when curl exits, uh, the connections, they close. <clears throat> That's just how it is, right? And just to sort of drive it in you know, properly, so this is how persistent connections work, illustrated. So we invoke curl, right? And we, in this particular example, we use first one URL that downloads from example.com, https example.com slash file one. And then we get another URL. It's completely different host name, still HTTPS, and, uh, but it's still a different server, right? So it's not the same connection. But then we do another uh, request, uh, another URL to this example.com host again, and then again to the uh, curl.se, but a different protocol. <clears throat> so basically, curl the laptop here sets up the connection to the first to the example.com. That's the first URL, right? HTTPS colon example.com slash file one, and we get that data from that server. And then it says, oh, we're going to talk to curl.se. We set up that connection and we get that transfer. But then the third transfer, you see, same scheme, same host name, same port number. We can reuse <coughs> the same connection again. So the third transfer here reuses the same connection to example.com. And we gain a lot of speed by that and <coughs> save resources and everything. But the fourth transfer, it's still the same host name, but it's a different scheme. So it cannot reuse the same connection. So it has to do a separate uh, third connection here to do the fourth transfer. And of course, after all these four transfers are completed, now we have three connections alive. So if we would have added a fifth transfer, it could possibly have used any of these three alive connections then. And of course, the connection pool has a limit, so it's not going to just keep everything alive for eternity, but it's going to close them off uh, as it goes along as well. <clears throat> so when you do downloads, you, as I mentioned, I had uh, this example before, when you do um, dash capital O, it's also called dash dash remote name, it picks the name from the no, the remote, the rightmost end of the URL, the file name part, that's where it picks the file name. So the, sort of, you know, when you provide a URL, you can see in the URL which kind of uh, file name it will use, and that's how it saves it. It's kind of convenient. Sometimes there's this content disposition header in the server, uh, it just provides a different name. Sometimes uh, the file name part of the URL is really crazy. And sometimes the servers are set up to do this. So you can use this remote header name and say, I want to use the name the server tells me to use, which of course is a bit dangerous because you might not know that ahead of time. So if you save it in a directory, maybe you overwrite some other files that has had the same name or something. It's, it's a little bit uh, tricky to use that, but it exists. And of course you can always use the shell direct redirect. So you can just, you know, get it to standard output and redirect to standard output often also very convenient and in particular then because then you can do a lot of URLs at once to the same output. You can limit, uh, for example, if you, you only want to do this, make sure that you never do this with files larger than a certain number of bytes. You set the limit and I never want to do the transfer if it's bigger than this, just to prevent perhaps if something is would have grown to some ridiculous size before you do the transfer. But it has a limited functionality and, and it's easily worked around because you don't always know how big a file is ahead of time and then this option is a little bit useless. So be aware. <coughs> Some other fun uh, option that often used and in combination with the dash capital O is the output dir option. It basically says, you, you know, the dash capital O saves in your current directory by default. So where you run curl, it will save the file. And that's kind of inconvenient sometimes. Then you can use the dash dash output dir option that says, instead of saving it here in my current directory, save it over there in that other directory. Um, like, let me show you. So for example, if I, if I would, if I would download let me see, for example, a, a typical random file from the internet called curl, like 8.2, what's the version number? Like, yeah, we can, here's, here's a download from a server somewhere, right? Bam. So now it's downloaded and you know, we know which kind of file name it, use, it uses. We know that it is this file name 
oops, sorry, um, because that's what we told it with a dash capital O. So we can make sure, was it actually that? Yeah, there's a three megabytes file there, exactly as we told. But if we didn't want it in the same file, uh, sorry, the same directory, we could have uh, used output dir and specified uh, some somewhere else, right? Uh, and then it would have tried to save it there instead. In this case, I don't have any such directory, so it doesn't work. But if I would do uh, somewhere as a directory, now there's a directory held called somewhere, and I could then put the download in somewhere instead of in my current directory, and we can just check somewhere. And there it is. Easy peasy. There's also this other option that you can also use, um, which is kind of handy in combination. That's the create dears option. So that makes it possible to um, do what I tried to do first here. If you go here and I provide an, an option that doesn't exist somewhere else, and then I use create dears, it will then create the directories uh, that I'm, ask, I'm asking to use, but they don't exist. And then you see some where else. Yep, there it is. Exactly as I asked for, and it created them for me because that's what I asked for. So, downloads, getting things down from the cloud. And sometimes when you download things, you fail, the, the, the transfer fails, and then you want curl to automatically retry because what if you set up an, a cron job you want to download currency rates every night and if the server for example has some little glitch at 4 a.m in the morning when your job runs you want to make tell curl to retry again if the error is transient sort of temporary and the server knows about it and it says so why not try again so we have this retry option creative name right it retries it's an option, it says retry, and you specify number, retry this many times. So in case it's a transient error, retry this many times and then give up. If it still fails, it'll return an error, but otherwise it'll try again. Um, and uh, of course, if you, it has this default uh, delay, I think it's exponential, so it will delay a little bit more longer after every uh, fail. Um, but if you want to specify yourself, I only want to retry this for a particular time. Maybe I just want to do this for a minute. So then I can li uh, limit in the time it will do those retries because yeah, then maybe you know why. I don't know. Or you can set a, a delay between each retry. So give it a minute between each retry, or maybe you can give it an hour between each retry. You you decide. That's you set the number of seconds to wait in case it ends up in a transient error. S you can also actually then tell, well, wait a minute. Let's consider a connection refused as a transient error. It's typically not a transient error because a connection refused is not typically transient, it could be something else. But you can tell curl to treat it like that. And then it'll consider, oh, it couldn't it couldn't connect to the server, it got a connection refused, but it will retry anyway because you asked it to. Or you can actually, I mean, the big hammer here to retry is to retry on all errors. Whatever happens, retry if, it, if you got an error. Um, it might be a little bit blunt, so be careful about this because it means literally means any error retry, and um, yeah, keep it in mind. Of course, you can upload data. Can, curl can uh, download and upload. Sometimes we forget about the upload part, right? Because maybe download is a little more used once. Again, remember upload from your client up to the server, and that's very easy. Usually pretty much whatever protocol you're using, you just use curl dash capital T file name and the URL. It's actually called dash dash upload file if you want to do it with the longer version. And if you don't provide the file name part in the URL itself, it curl will put that file, the local file name at the end of the URL. I'll show you so like this. If you, if you want to upload the local file name called file to this uh, URL, as you can see, it ends with a slash. There's no file name part in this URL. Curl will then put that file name part to in, in the URL at the 
rightmost part of the URL. So it'll be called file in the remote side as well. Or you can decide to put it there yourself. You, you could, for example, upload it to a different name. And if you want to do it HTTP-wise, I'm going to get back to that because uh, we have just gotten started and there's a lot to say about HTTP, but I'm, I'm going to save that until we sort of all warmed up and cozy. So anyway, so if you, if you do transfers, upload, download, sometimes you want to control the speed, the pace, you know, how things are going. And curl then offers a busload of different options. What if you're doing a transfer and it takes, and it really, you know, it goes really, really slow and you want it, you let's stop it. If it goes too slow, cancel it, go away. We can try again tomorrow. And how do you tell curl to do that? Well, if it's below a certain threshold for a certain number of time, uh, well, a certain, certain period of time, then kill the transfer. If you're below, and here we're talking about bytes per second and then seconds. So if you're below 10,000 bytes per second for 60 seconds, kill it. Or because, you know, if you're below 10 bytes per second in five seconds, kill it. Or why not do it like this? Uh, the reverse situation, pretty much, right? Uh, you don't want to clog up your pipe by my huge download that just eats all your bandwidth. So no, no, no. Just use approximately 100k per second. Uh, this is kilobytes per second uh, when you download. So don't download faster or don't transfer faster than this. Basically, it could be if you want to, for example, if you want to do a, a huge number of simultaneous H, uh, curl command lines, right? And you know you have a limited bandwidth, maybe you want to make them, uh, you know, work together in a better way. So maybe, I don't know. If you want to limit the rate, if you want to slow it down, make sure that it doesn't go faster than this. And by this, it's actually a rough average so it might actually during periods be slightly faster slightly slower because going with the limit rate like this it's uh, it's a bit of a bit of a black magic thing so um don't get upset if you get a 101 or 99k instead of 100 but it'll usually average out on 100. <clears throat> so and sometimes you might let's not do more than this number of transfers per time unit and this, for example, might be the case when you get a lot of transfers with curl, but you don't want them, you know, you don't want to torture your server by getting a million transfers the first second. Maybe you want to distribute them over an hour, a week, I don't know. And then you can tell curl, no, 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 use this rate of transfer starts, no more than two per second. For example, here's a range, download 20 JPEGs from the server only two per second and or rather not more than two per second or not more than three per hour or why not more than 14 per minute and then there's as you can see shm there are look it up in the documentation it's all documented so this number of starts per time unit to make sure that you don't you know kill your server by by going overly eager to, to get your stuff um, you can also do other fun th things. For example, um, if you, in many cases, for example, if you you want to deploy your site, you you're gonna you, you're gonna deploy your site, and you know the name of your of public site, and it's up there. But you're working on your you are working on your private development version of of this server, and it's over here with different IP address. But you wanted to use then you can go with, for example, redirect. You use the, s the correct URL, but you can sort of fiddle with the name resolving, for example, like this. So instead of going to the resolving example.com and going to the real example.com site, <coughs> you tell uh, curl that uh, example.com is actually resolved to this IP address, 127.0.0.1. So instead of going to the real example.com, it will go to your local host and try to get this uh, page, the URL. Of course, if you're using HTTPS, there might be some challenges. But anyway, you can do it like this. Or you can redirect to an IPv6 address, of course. Or you can, 
even there's a the different thing you can even redirect from one name and port number to another name and port number by using the slightly different option called connect to which is which i know people have been using for example if you want to go to let's say you have a particular site and you have your site consists of 12 different load balancers so you go to one of the either one of those 12 when you go to your site but this today you want to go to a specific one that you want to torture try uh, and so then you can instead of going to example.com being the generic one uh, replace the example.com with your specific spe particular specific load balancer host name um, and use that instead or whatever you can pretty much uh, these are um, very much you know it allows you to fiddle and create be creative with how you want to do things so uh, and in particular when you you should remember that what is in the url that's the for example where curl picks the name for the sni when doing tls negotiations so it's uh, you want to make sure that you understand that so when you use the, the right name and sni part that's what decides which certificate the server will provide for you and that's also the server will also make sure that the sni name is a name that it knows about so that um, you, it knows that you're talking to the right server the right host um, and of course if you're just b basic http lingo use something it's all sometimes fun useful uh, convenient to be able to set the host header and then you can just set that host header it's just dash capital a set the host header to something um, that is not the same as a, a server name maybe or maybe it is it's up to you <coughs> again if you use tls and you really should then you might have a certificate checks that fail here so sometimes that might actually warrant that you're using dash dash insecure or dash k if you're perfectly aware of what you're doing and you don't do it in protection i don't know you decide anyway so when we set up connections to different servers i showed you how it reuses persistent connections and i also wanted to get into how do you set up a connection uh, these days and maybe um maybe 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 you're not really aware how we do things in in modern tcp clients these days and we're starting out simple we do things we raise ipv6 versus ipv4 and we call that happy, happy eyeballs it's an algorithm it's actually uh, what is said to be uh, the correct way to connect to servers using multiple um, ip families or ipv6 and ipv4 uh, you can avoid this by saying i want to use ipv4 i want to use ipv6 if you have a particular reason to to restrict yourself or curl to that you can do that uh, look at that that's a curl on a laptop um, and curl of course it wants to connect curl.se in this case it will resolve the host name uh, from the dns server right hello dns server where is curl.se and curl.se is actually an excellent example here because curl.se has a ridiculous amount of ip addresses so look eight uh, ipv6 addresses and four ipv4 addresses so how do you go about to use them well first curl will use all the ipv6 addresses initiate the connection and it will iterate through them all try the first then if that fails try the next try the next try the next try the next and the first one that works it'll be happy with right but if it takes if once it has started this ipv6 connecting to connection attempt it will slightly afterwards start with its ipv4 attempt so they will go in parallel at the same time and the one that is uh, succeeds first it wins so in, in this case it gives ipv6 a little little head start to make it sort of prioritized a little bit but if it's slow for some reason or fails for some reason uh, ipv4 might win and both of them have this each of them have their own lists with ip addresses to go through right so if it, one of those fails it'll try the next one until it's run out of the options and the first one that uh, connects it wins everything else is uh, cancelled killed disconnected and that is how the connection that curl will use so connections then it, they use a specific network interface so you can uh, also actually if you have multiple network interfaces which you might do in servers you can actually ask curl to use this particular network interface when you go out to reach to that 
uh, that uh, server uh, this is really uh, a particular choice but usually you don't care usually the routing table in your kernel will do that for you you can also do other things that usually don't you don't care about but you can limit the port number range that curl will use as source port numbers in the tcp connection um, also again very i mean you have to be a particular condition to do this at all um, there's also this for example when you do tcp connections as all of these are mostly often at least uh, using tcp you can set a tcp keep alive tcp keep alive is a little option that you set for a connection that makes it send a few bits and pieces back and forth every now and then to help curl to detect when the connection goes down and you can use that you can set keep alive time send a little ping every 23 seconds even if nothing happens to just detect uh, disconnects better it actually sets t tcp keep alive by default but this allows you to set the, the timing if you, if you want to do it more strict for example and uh, why not use uh, your own custom dns server and this of course if you build curl with CARES, which i'm afraid to say uh, most people don't but if you do you have the option to say i want to use that particular dns server when i resolve the host name and not the one that i would otherwise put, uh, use which is also a way to to be creative and, and for particular use cases and of course doing things over the internet sometimes is very slow sometimes it's ridiculously fast curl doesn't really know how fast things are going to be maybe you're very very close and you have a really high speed network maybe you're talking to a server on the other side of the globe and uh, everything is really really slow uh, so there then we provide options to say i don't want the entire operation to take longer than this many seconds my transfer from the from the moment i start it until it's done it may it will it should not take life it's not allowed to take longer than this amount of time in this case 12.34 seconds this is number of seconds so it, it's the it limits the entire operation it should be done within this or it will be stopped and an error will be returned um, this of course it's really hard sometimes to set this maximum time because again maybe you don't know either how fast it'll be uh, because it's really hard to know so it's usually you don't want to have this too restricted because maybe it's very slow sometimes and very fast other times so, so you can also instead say wait a minute i just wanted to try to connect to this server for this amount of time and if, if it hasn't connected by this time fail and this allows you to just maybe fail earlier because if if the connect if it takes this long just to connect to the server it's maybe not even bother it may be not worth to try it so only try 3.14 seconds in this case um, and then give it up and i, I want to say then because i get this question sometimes the connect timeout is sort of the time from start until the connection is there and connected everything up to that point and then it's not counted anymore so if you set the max time to 12 that's going to be no never everything is going to be done by 12 seconds if you set max connect timeout if you set the connect timeout to three and the connection connects then there's no more timeout so you usually sometimes at least often use both of these uh, options so that you can limit both the connect time and the maximum time or either or you you choose so I mentioned this briefly before. This is a way to provide credentials. This is a .NET RC. It's actually a file to store credentials. It's actually for FTP servers. And it was invented a long time ago. The default one is, is in the home directory called .NET RC. It's actually invented or created back in 1978. So, um, it's not quite as old as I am, but it's way, way, way older than curl. And if you use that just not RC, curl will find that and use it and use that to find credentials for your particular servers that you're using. You can also actually, like this, identify a different file if you want to use a different file. Again, if you save credentials in this file, you really want to make sure that nobody else can read this file because it's you don't want your secrets out. Well, well maybe you do, but 
you should do that with knowledge at least. And it works for all protocols for curl, and it's actually a very weakly specified. It's, I, I call it a standard. I don't know. It's not a standard. It's more of a habit, or, or, or a lot of implementations use it. But there's um, there are different interpretations how to parse everything, so it might not work perfectly interoperably between tools. Anyway, this is how it looks like. If you check, this is a credentials login uh, when, when you access the machine example.com. Machine, login, password. Easy peasy. And of course, when you run curl, uh, one of the convenient things you want to do is, especially when you run curl from, from shell scripts, is that you want to check uh, the exit code, right? Because the exit code will tell you how it did. If it returns zero, if it exits with an exit status zero, that means success. It succeeded, no error. It went exactly as what you asked for. You got what you asked for. So if, you d if it didn't return, if it doesn't return a zero, something went wrong. And then it returns a numer numerical value back then, so, so to the shell prompt, whatever called curl. And it's very convenient. And it's zero for success. Zero means everything went exactly what you asked. You, you got what you asked for. Everything else is an error. And what particular error? Uh, the number actually tells you because the number is there. It's a fixed static uh, error number that will tell you exactly what it is. And you should, of course, test for that pretty much. If you do like this, for example, if you cannot save this file in this particular directory, you get an error. In this case, error 23, failure writing output to destination. Yep, you can't save it there, error 23. So it failed. And then you can check in your man page, what does error 23 mean? If in this case, of course, it actually says it. So anyway, um, you can also then, of course, if you write a shell script, for example, write the curl command, check the return code. Was it zero? If it wasn't zero, it failed. And then you can take action. Or rather, when you write shell scripts, you probably should do it like this, or some version of that. And there are, I think, we have documented up to number 99, I think. And they're all documented. This is a, a snippet from the man page, the first 12 error codes. I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to show you that they, they are there. Um, so they sort of describe what they are, and they are fixed. They will not be changed. Uh, when we add new ones, we add them last. So the ones that exist now, you know that error seven there, you see, failed to connect to host. Yeah, it's going to be number seven, even five years down the road or 12. You can do, um, can do curl to a lot of protocols, of course. I just want to highlight a few of them a little bit particular because SCP and SFTP is a little bit different than many other protocols. They're based on TLS, so they're they're use they're not based on TLS. They're based on SSH, which makes them a little bit different because they don't use the CA system, for example, and that's not a little bit different. So anyway, you use it just like any other URL, and in this case, you're telling curl which username uh, it has. Uh, it should use. Um, you can use SCP. They're two different. They are different protocols. They both go over SSH. So, in particular, we usually we recommend going with SFTP, the first one, because it's slightly more portable and defined. The second one, SCP, is uh, less portable. But um, use whatever you works for you. Um, if you terminate or end the URL with a trailing slash like that, it's marked in blue here in my example, you will get a directory listing because there's no file name part there. So you're asked for a download, but without a file name in the URL, it means a directory listing. And that goes actually for several of the protocols curl supports if they support directory listings. That's SFTP, uh, FTP, and, and a few others. Some a little p peculiar thing with the SFTP URL format is that if you go with just, uh, if you can see this slash till the slash thing in the beginning of the path, uh, it actually means that it it gets this file to do.txt from the user from the user's home directory, based on then on the particular user that accesses this height site. <coughs> it's a, a a little bit extra thing, but both SCP and SFTP do that. And of course, these protocols, 
they use is this dot ssl slash known hosts file by default which is a host it's a file that basically remembers fingerprints from the servers you have accessed in the past so that it'll detect if the servers change or if they're the same you can also use this dash dash insecure similar to how you do it how you would do it with the tls based protocol it basically means skip the known hosts check so that even if the server name and the fingerprints uh, deviate if they don't match uh, ignore that and continue anyway which is uh, suddenly an insecure way to do it and you really should avoid insecure of course you can also read email and, and by reading then of course it's a download in curls uh, lingo right yeah and yeah you can absolutely upload upload with scp and sftp as well in most actually most protocols i'm talking about you can actually do both download and upload um imap you can upload to pop3 cannot upload it can only download uh, but but as, as, as a, from, from a current perspective reading an email is like getting data that is the download so if you want to read a pop3 email you can do that with curl on an imap there's actually a little more complication than just what I'm showing you here, but sort of the, the gist is like this. And of course, you want to add TLS, as I've already mentioned several times by now. But so that you, and in the same vein, you send the email by uploading data to SMTP. SMTP then cannot download actually. And in the same as before, I showed you before how to do an upload with curl. You upload, you use dash capital T, send data. This file has data you send it to this url and here here are the credentials with the dash u option in the smtp case you need to have uh, that file formatted correctly and so on so it's a little bit complicated because as i told you a little bit before curl doesn't actually know about content right so he doesn't know how to make a mail uh, content like that um, but it knows how to send the actual mail <coughs> It's a little bit complicated, but you can easily learn it. And go on, going on further, you can do the, the pretty much the same thing with MQTT. It's a, it's a um, usually a way to work with smaller embedded systems. And you can in there you can download data. That basically means subscribing to something like a bedroom temperature, or you can upload data or set data. That's sort of um, you can set like this, you set the value of 75 to the kitchen dimmer um, with the MQTT colon slash slash uh, scheme in URL. So download, upload, even though in those particular protocols, they don't actually speak about download, upload. Um, so going further, the same thing again, TFTP, another protocol, uh, usually working with and there's an older protocol done over UDP. People uh, usually first has been for embedded system, typically booting when download your your bootloader or something over the network when you want to start the tiny little system. And then it, because it's a t, the T stands for trivial, the trivial file transfer protocol. It's pretty easy, basic thing, but it works the same thing. I, I mean, the same way, as you can see the command line, you want to download something from the TFTP server, just specify it, or you want to upload a file to the TFTP server. Again, dash capital T, there's the file, there's the server, there's the URL. Upload, download. You you see a, a pattern here, I hope. Telnet, of course, is the odd child in the family. Uh, and really, uh, if I would have done it today, maybe I wouldn't have allowed Telnet in because it's not really, it's, uh, it's a weird sibling, but, um, you can use it and you can connect to it and it reads uh, input from standard in it will send output to standard out and it's really <laughs> inconvenient it, it doesn't really do uploads or uploads uh, it, it's that session based thing so you can use it and, and play with it it's fun uh, but mm, it's different let me say that another fun thing of course maybe not the mostly used protocol in the curl family dict dictionary lookups um, and here we can uh, see some examples. Let me see if I can uh, do one of them in a terminal instead, like this curl dict. And this is then a dictionary uh, lookup of the word curl on this uh, on the server dict.org, which is then a dictionary online. So then I ask for it and I get 
different matches for curl like this. Very, very useful. Um, yeah, there are there. Uh, I can obviously then use like if I use a def definition of Heisenbug, Heisenbug from the dictionary jargon. I think that's what it means, and then I get the, the definition then <coughs> like this. Very fun, um, or maybe not. Uh, okay, so at least. There's also this experimental uh, protocol uh, support for, for WebSocket. It's coming, it's still experimental, so it's not enabled by default. So most of you will not have it. So I'm not going to get into much of the details here, but it's going to be used in a similar way. Um, job, uh, WebSocket is not strictly upload download either. It's more of a session thing, but mm, it's used as an upload download thing often enough so that in many cases you can point this to a WebSocket stream and you just get it sent out somewhere. Anyway, by the time uh, in the future you will be able to, to try out much more about w with the WebSocket stuff at least. So I wanted to mention then that a lot of people that are, are going to use curl and use curl to mimic things that um, the browser do or to do things with the browser and they, they try to do things with a curl command line and sometimes you end up wait a minute what well, it, it looks very different i did it with my browser and then when i do it with curl it looks completely different why is that and and can you explain that um, sometimes phrased in, in less friendly way but it's of course one of the primary reasons why for example, when you get things sent to standard, uh, let me move me up there. If you, for example, use curl and you send data to standard output in your terminal, for example, and you get um, a particular HTML file, maybe the character set that you're downloading is not the same one you're displaying in your terminal. So character set is a big explanation to why the HTML and the browser would show something in a completely different way than you would see when you get the raw HTML in your terminal. Or even if you load it into your editor or whatever, it might not be the same character set. Um, that's, that's a very big explanation. And you might have to ask for the right uh, language, character set or whatever in request headers. And uh, many times um, the server will also give you different results depending on who they think is asking. And who they think is asking might be following protocol standards and just follow, you know, proper headers, or they might be second guessing who's who's there and just give you depending on who they think or who they guess is actually asking. So it, there's actually always uh, a, um, a risk or sort of an opportunity to get different things from diff depending on curl and browsers, and then of course browsers and the web today uses. Um, a lot of JavaScript and curl doesn't do JavaScript. So if you download something with has JavaScript in it, you know, all bets are off and things are going to go completely different ways in the browser compared to the curl uh, request getting the same URL. Just remember that. And of course, um, th then when they do things with JavaScript and everything, um, they can also set cookies, for example, in JavaScript. And if curl doesn't do JavaScript, the browser version might get a lot of cookies and so on. I I'll, go, I'll, I'll get back into more HTTP details um, soon. And of course, uh, nowadays, uh, yeah, let me save that. Uh, <coughs> I want to show you then. So for example, if you want to know, if you want to figure out exactly what, what a browser does and you want to do that with curl, uh, you can, of course, figure that out yourself, or you can uh, use the feature copy as curl. It is a widely, uh, uh, well, it's a common feature these days in a lot of tools and in, I think, all the browsers nowadays. It basically is a way for you to generate the curl command line to mimic a previous transfer. All of these browsers, all the big ones, have the copy as curl feature, and it's actually available in several other tools as well. I know it's available in several uh, sort of man in the middle proxies and other tools that help you do things um, HTTP. You have you always have to remember that this is never perfect. It's always as a starting point. It might be s sort of, it gives you a good insight exactly what to do, but then you need to do something fun yourself with it. And I, I wanna show you a cool little example here. And let me, to do this, so I'm going to 
take away the terminal and I'm going to bring up a Chrome browser. So this is a Chrome. Um, it shows a website I've seen before. And I'm going to show you, I'm just going to find it here myself. So here's the, I'm, I'm scrolling here. here. If I press F5, it'll reload it, right? It was very slow for some reason. It doesn't matter. So anyway, so here's here's the web page, and I can press F12 to go into Developer Tools. F12. There's also a menu option, but I don't want to press the menu option. So if I if I go here and I press the Network tab here, and I can do the reload again, uh, and then I can see that we have a lot of well, maybe not a lot. Or some web pages will have a lot more resources, but we can see, for example, this. Uh, the browser got the the, fr um, the front the main page the HTML page and then we can go. I want to do this with curl, copy, copy as curl, select. Nice. Where is my terminal? Here it is. Remove the browser and then in my terminal I don't want to see any more dict. I paste the curl command line. So this is the curl command line, Chrome. Uh, say they used to do that. This is done a pretty much the same thing Chrome did, but in curl lingo. I press <laughs> and I got nothing. Yeah, to show you how how complicated things can be. Um, and of course, if I wanted to figure out exactly what happened, I would use dash. I believe uh, dash v. Oh right, and it, you see, we got it 304. It means that it has not been updated since the one we asked for, and that means that this uh, particular request used conditions like this, blah blah blah. So it actually didn't get a new one because we asked for not getting it if it's not been modified since this date. I'll show you in a second how that works, and I also uh, if I do remove my terminal and I pop up a Firefox instead. Looks very similar, right? Uh, so if I go to the Firefox one, uh, it's here. Uh, and if I, for some reason, it's the same key, right? F12. And here's a network tab. I can do reload. And again, look at this. Here's uh, the, f the front page. And I can do copy value, copy uh, copy as curl select. I remove the Firefox. I bring up my terminal, and here's here's the Chrome thing. And then now instead, I paste the Firefox one. It looks a little bit different. A big blob of stuff. Uh, does it use the conditional thing? At least, yeah, it does. If modified since, so yeah, it didn't get anything either. So it got also got the 304 response, and I can, which I, if I add the dash v, I will see the dash HTTP 2 304 not updated. <coughs> Whew. So, fun thing. That's a very convenient thing. Oh, did you? S did you? Uh, yeah. So that's a very convenient thing. I can recommend using that when you want to reproduce what a browser did in, in curl. It's never perfect and you should be aware that cookies and for example you want to uh, you want to double check exactly what it's doing and, and how you really want to do it. And you can do other things to figure out the browsers. I will I will show you later on how you can do SSL keylog file and also uh, this uh, other fun thing, if you want to mimic, for example, I want to show you this fun little um, service that I have, which is called if uh, calls headers to curl. So basically, if you do like this, and I, now I need a terminal as well. Here's my terminal. Okay, so if I go to uh, now, I have different tabs on this terminal. So as you can see, they change color. So in, in this tab, I'm going to do, I'm going to run NC, NC being network cat or whatever it's called. So it, the exact options here vary a little bit. There are different versions of NCs. So sometimes it's not dash L dash, dash P, sometimes it's slightly different. It basically mean wait for, a, uh, listen for a connection on port 8080 and uh, just output what it does. So it does, uh, it does nothing right now port 8080 and then I could go like I can switch on my 
uh, Firefox over here and I can go to localhost colon 8080 it didn't do anything we think but if we check out the terminal in, in the back there we see that it's actually uh, my mouse is acting up a little bit so where are we hello <laughs> uh, okay sorry for that uh, okay so there we can see in the terminal that we got a bunch of headers right so these are <laughs> these are uh, <laughs> that's a fun cookie uh, I don't remember that's some kind of test cookie I've done for anyway so we can see that these are the requ this is the request that, that the browser would send to the server. So why do we do this? Well, we, it's a cool experiment, experiment, right? So this is what the server did. And we can copy the entire header set, right? Then so we do copy. That's how I do it with this um, terminal. And we can go back to Firefox. And then we go to my cool service called headers to curl. And in this particular form here, we just paste the entire header set the entire request actually from the get down to the last header bam how do we make a curl command line that does the same thing convert bam and here this is now the curl command line that reproduces the same <laughs> browser uh, request that we just did uh, towards our own server so that's a completely different way to mimic the same thing but sort of listening in the server and rather than copying it from from the browser it's really convenient and this is also convenient uh, in particular if you you know you get you, you have the headers somewhere uh, or like there's a bun big bunch of headers and you you want to convert them to a curl command line um just a convenient thing and um of course, uh, I can never talk about curl without mentioning the cool dash dash curl command line, which is, of course, a way to generate libcurl source code from a curl command line. So if you do a curl command line and you're happy with it and you want to convert it into a libcurl source code, dash dash libcurl is there for you. So you, you want to you go, um, yeah, for example, if we, one, if we go back, where am I? I'm in the wrong tab. If I go back to one of these huge generated things, right? This is the one that uh, Firefox generated as copy as curl from Firefox. Okay, but we want to make a libcurl command, uh, libcurl source code that uses this. So I, I add here on the on the very end of the command line. I could put it anywhere in the command line, but I put it in the end. I do uh, cool code dot c. And then when it does this, it now saves a um, C code. It's now called coolcode.c. And this is now an embry for how to write. This is now, if I, I could now compile this actually, and you, I will have the first embry OT, a command tool that actually performs this request then that we just copied uh, this way. As you can see, it doesn't really, it doesn't make a perfect copy of everything so you might need to tweak it and there are some defaults and so on so but this is, is meant as a first skeleton and embryo for you to to get something started and then you build from that and what could possibly go wrong <coughs> it's pretty cool and is um it's actually also that way that even if you don't use c even if you want to use another one of these bindings there are over 60 different bindings for libcurl. So even if you want to do a different language than C, doing this way, you at least get uh, a lot of options, names, and a, f a rough uh, idea how to do things because most bindings are very thin layers on top of the C API. So then you can usually pretty easy copy it over and modify it just a little bit. Going forward into TLS. I'm only on on slide um, 81, and w I'm two hours in. So, uh, if you if you want if you thought I was going to do this in two and a half hours, I'm sorry to do this point. I uh, might be done in three hours. Okay, <coughs> so 
again, you want to do TLS. You don't want to do the protocols without TLS, also referred to as SSL all, all over. In our documentation, we mix and match SSL and TLS all over, all the time. It's the same thing, or actually nothing is SSL these days. It's all TLS, but the name is still used all over. So um, don't care about if it's SSL or TLS. It's the same thing to us. Um, it's done for s transport security. We want it unless we use SSH, of course, but SSH is also fine, but their SSH is only for SCP and SFTP. For all the others we talk about, we use TLS. And, and when we talk about TLS, we protocol wise actually verify the pair. And what does it mean to verify the pair? It means that um, we sort of we have a we have a handshake and we verify that the server we are talking to is has proven itself to be have a certificate that is signed by someone you trust po and, and so on so there's a lot of digital checks there right and by doing that we prevent e eavesdropping now no one on the network off the network no one in between can read your network uh, your data or anything and it uh, they cannot tamper with the data they cannot change anything so they cannot see what it is they cannot modify the data uh, and typically t t the use of tls is sort of indicated or hinted by the URL scheme as in HTTPS, S, therefore secure. So we know that if it's HTTPS, it has TLS. But of course, you can still uh, kill security by, <laughs> by doing it wrong. Don't do that. But, but and uh, all schemes curl uh, supports them. So that ends with S, they do TLS. So basically, you know, IMAP S, SMTP S, uh, POP3 S, they're all uh, TLS based. And if you want to do TLS with one of these other, uh, some of those others, some other protocols, and which protocols they are, you can only sort of learn by reading the documentation. But FTP, IMAP, POP3, SMTP, LDAP, they all have a different way to upgrade into TLS when you, so they start out without, they, they can start out without TLS and then negotiate your way up to TLS based. So you can go with an FTP colon slash slash URL, use SSL required, this use SSL required option, and then it'll sort of switch over to the TLS version, which is also the fine way to do it. And again, use TLS. With TLS, there are different versions. We started out, well, SSL was invented, created in, in the mid 90s by Netscape. SSL v2, I think, was the first one that was actually ever actually used. It was later deprecated because it was insecure. Then we had got SSL v3, also deprecated because insecure. Then we got TLS version 1.0, and uh, also deprecated by now, and so on. So we have sort of gone over range of different versions over the years but, but you should know that curl always tries to get the latest and most suitable sort of set of version and ciphers negotiated automatically so typically you don't need to care about that but you can if you for example if for some reason want to fiddle with that you can ask for a lowest possible accepted version or and you can ask for a highest possible accepted version of TLS uh, versions usually you don't want to care. We also have the SSL v2, SSL v3 options. They typically never work these days because the TLS libraries and all of them have disabled them, so don't bother. When curl connects to a TLS server, it verifies the certificate in the server side, right? Connects to example.com, check that the certificate we get from that server is trusted. It comes from example.com and it's been signed by someone we trust, by a certificate authority. And curl is set to trust a number of certificate authorities that have then been used to sign certificates to service or all, all over the world, right? And those certificate authorities are uh, in a, basically a bunch of uh, signatures in a file somewhere in your file system. There's also ah, let's let's don't care about that. So you can then. Uh, typically use curl as the CAs in a file somewhere in your file system or you use the native um, way to check certificates. The native one is for example if you use S channel on Windows or you use um, secure transport on Mac they have their native uh, CA support so basically curl just asks the operating system is this trusted and then 
they tell you. Otherwise, you can use this option dash dash CA cert to point to a file. These are my CA certs that I that we should trust. And you you know you can edit that and only provide the CAs that you trust. You can avoid checking the CA uh, the search completely the server cert by using the insecure or dash K, which then of course, as the name implies, makes it really insecure because you skip the check you don't know that you're actually talking to the right server and if you don't talk to the right server it could be an imposter and then they of course that the fake one could read all your data and give you the wrong data back or whatever everything is then open for bad stuff you can use and here's a url uh, to a service we provide that always provide the firefox ca cert bundle automatically converted for you in PEM format. So it's actually updated daily. So if you go there, you can get the latest CA cert bundle that Mozilla uh, maintains provided for Firefox. And they get in, you get it in a convenient ver uh, format that works immediately for curl in a PEM format. And avoid dash K, which is then of course the insecure thing. With curl, you can also uh, check for stapling because certificate revocation you know when when a certificate has gone bad and you want to revoke it the system for that doesn't really work really well over the world so sometimes bad certificates remain out there and remain in use and it's hard to detect that and the, uh, one way to um, sort of counter that bad system is to use UC USCP stapling which basically means that the certificate provides a guarantee that this has been recently verified to be up to date and you can add, use curl to ask for that stapling check that your double check that the server is actually still it's not revoked you can also do the uh, certificates the other way which is basically the client providing certificates to the server saying hey i'm i'm the correct uh, client talking to you uh, often called them the mutual authentication because server to client always happens so if you go with client to server also it's mutual um, and then you pretty much just here's my certificate here's my password uh, or split up in, in different uh, options here's my certificate and my key when talking to a particular server and how would you get a certificate you would get it somehow from the server or from some admin somehow I don't know how, usually uh, using some other means, uh, using a secret handshake in the park yesterday evening or something. And of course you can, in, when, it, when we're talking TLS, there are TLS ciphers, different ways to encrypt and, and, and uh, hash th things. So you negotiate which ciphers and everything to use and the client, of uh, sorry, curl of course negotiates that with the server when it sets up the connection and which particular ones to use you can control or change with the dash dash ciphers option again typically you don't do that because typically you just use and, and curl does its best to pick the best one but you can change if you want to and if you use a tls based proxy like an hps proxy there are different options to set the proxy options so you can go with both you can control both the connection to the proxy and the connection to the remote host so lots of stuff when talking about ciphers today and tls people then often bring up post quantum because uh, that sort of lies in the time so post quantum when the quantum computers come they will break a lot of ciphers and rather encryption algorithms that we've been using in the past so if you want your da data that you encrypt today to survive when the post quantum computers sort of become capable capable enough you need to switch to post quantum safe ciphers right and how do you do that luckily for us that's all in the tls library so if the tls libraries support post quantum uh, ciphers you can use uh, select them with the same options sort of out of our hands and we pass on that responsibility and fun job to the tls libraries there's this uh, url with lots of this is a cipher names uh, if you want to read up more i should also just mention then that of course curl supports a lot of different tls backends so if you get if you run your particular curl command line today uh, depending on things one of these different thing one of these different libraries on the right side might have been used when it was built 
and you might then have different uh, behavior you can they might use different ca stores they have different features and they work on different platforms some of them are native on platforms and so on and open ssl is the by far most commonly used and sort of possibly the most commonly known as well uh, and that is one one of these 12 different ones that curl can be built to use and of course if you build curl yourself go crazy go with the one you want to use slightly limited of course um, depending on which platform you're on so it might limit your options <clears throat> in tls we encrypt everything so when you use a tls uh, connection from a client to a server it's you cannot read the contents of the traffic right you cannot snoop on the traffic but not being able to snoop on the traffic can be really problematic when you want to understand what is going on here what is happening i want to know nope it's encrypted but then luckily uh, someone invented this fun ssl keylog file actually i think it's invented by the nss people and the firefox developers many many moons ago so basically what this means is that you can set a environment variable called ssl keylog file and you specify a file name actually set ssl keylog file equals a file name and then if you use that if you set that first and then you use a tool that supports this like firefox chrome curl th when they are started and this one exists they will save the secrets the tls secrets in that file name the runtime secrets so you don't have to figure that out you don't have to be a sort of you know crack it in a way it'll save the secrets for you and if you then use a tool like f f wireshark for example and who doesn't use wireshark right so if you use wireshark you can tell wireshark get the secrets from this file that we we're saving all the secrets to and then we can run curl save the secrets and wireshark can get the secrets and decrypt the tls over the wire or or decrypt the firefox traffic and it works like this in in here's um the config window from a wireshark a while ago it might not look exactly like this and this is uh, on linux maybe it looks different on windows so here i said oh my pre-master secret log file name is called home daniel tmp tls key the secrets will end up there so and then i go there uh, go to the secret tls data with my browser and then uh, in Wireshark, I snooped on the traffic and it can decrypt everything and show content. So in this case, actually an HTTP2 traffic from way ago. I found this screenshot, it's very old, but it looks like this anyway. And it managed to decrypt the data and show the contents of the traffic. Very convenient, you should use it. Proxies is a way to do traffic sort of with an intermediary that sits between you <laughs> and where you want to go uh, it's an a proxy is an intermediary a man in the middle somewhere in between and it, it, basically if i wanted to show you with a with the pictures i that's the client that's a curl laptop a laptop again talking to the website and you know normally we just go directly to the website setting up a connection and we communicate back and forth when, but when we introduce a proxy in this game we have that's the middleman right the intermediary so it, it sits on the network a so we do a connection to the proxy first and the proxy it's then relays data over to the website on network b so the client on the left side it doesn't have a direct connection to the website it goes via the intermediary that's that's what a proxy is right a middleman so it is common thing in enterprises and companies and organizations to have these sort of mandatory things so for example maybe your machine at work you cannot connect to the server directly you have to configure a proxy to reach the server and how do you know which proxy your machine is using well normally curl doesn't it, it doesn't auto detect it it can't find it by itself you have to tell curl where is it and usually you can find out that in your browser network settings or your computer's network settings and there it is um, and then you can for example uh, sometimes you also have it set in environment variables that's a common unixy way to do it sometimes when you configure a proxy especially when you configure browsers you you have these pack files proxy auto configuration a pack file is something as ugly as a small 
well, it's supposed to be small, sometimes it's really big, JavaScript thing that given a URL returns what proxy to use, which makes it really complicated for curl because curl doesn't speak JavaScript. So maybe you need to parse that JavaScript. Just Usually it's very simple. You know, usually you don't have a lot of different proxies to select from anyway. But you, know, you should be aware, sometimes you need to sort of do some a little bit of detective work to figure out which, which exact proxy your curl command line should use. Uh, talking about um, proxies, then I, I also wanted to that mention the, the thing, you know, called captive portals. Typically your, you know, your uh, airport or hotel or stuff, when, when you cannot get on to the internet before you log in, before you pay, before you do something, before you agree to click, 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 that's a captive portal. It limits you until you've done something and then you're allowed out to the internet. They're not actually proxies, but so they sort of work similar to that. And of course, curl will always also be, well, not always, but it will be limited to, by captive portals in the same way as your typical browser will. <coughs> Doing proxies, that that man in the middle machine, there are several different proxy types and curl speaks a lot of them. So you can have, for example, HTTP or SOX, different kinds of proxies. And when you talk about HTTP, there can be different. You can do speak HTTP, HTTPS, you can do HTTP2 over HTTPS. And SOX also have, we speak, we talk SOX in four different flavors. We have SOX4 and we have SOX5. We have SOX4 that resolves the host name itself or you re let this proxy resolve the host name and and the same thing with five so a lot of different sort of flavors here and you set you typically set um, the type as a sort of made up url scheme when you use the dash dash proxy option it's kind of convenient you can even actually set a pre-proxy that allows you to set a SOX proxy that connects to an http proxy it's super crazy but uh, some people do that if you want to do Tor transfers with curl, that is typically set up through a SOX proxy. Usually then you do your connection or you point out the SOX proxy and that is your entry point into the Tor network. And then you provide a URL and that URL then is used sort of into the Tor network. There's also these concepts of a forward proxy and a reverse proxy. And in, in these cases, we talk about forward proxy because the, the forward proxy is usually in the curl uh, sort of in the client side, curl side, the reverse proxy is usually in the server side. So we can, as a client, as a curl user, we can often ignore the concept of reverse proxies. I'm just mentioning it so that you know that the words are there. Curl then of course speaks HTTPS proxies. And if, if you're going to do with a, if you're going with an HTTP proxy or an HTTPS proxy, again, we say TLS is better than not TLS. So go with a T HTTPS proxy if you can. So then it'll, um, authenticate the proxy and it will encrypt all the traffic so that other users on network A cannot see your traffic. If you go with an H even if the, even if you talk to the website with the HTTP, for example, which is a clear text version, if the if you use an HTTPS proxy, you're protecting your network uh, your data at least from people on the network A here and this. And of course, curl supports both HTTP one and HTTP two and talking to the HTTP PS proxy. Complicated but fun stuff and a lot of options to allow you to you know tweak those things. Some people are also using these man in the middle proxies that sometimes you use them for debugging, sometimes you use them for surveillance, which basically they try to intercept your traffic without you knowing it. So you don't explicitly tell which proxy to use. They just magically know that there is an outgoing uh, uh, connection going on so they intercept it and go with and let it go through a proxy and sort of they terminate the traffic and send back something but the the good part with you using tls all the time is that you will notice because they cannot do that without sort of permission because the only way to uh, make that work is that the client needs to permit it by um, saying that that ca that sits in the proxy is okay it's trusted Normally, it's not going to be trusted. So normally, those connections are going to fail. But of course, blindly trusting a middleman like this and, and middleman in general like this is uh, is not very nice. 
And of course, you can do authentication with proxies, which basically means that you have credentials and there are different ways to authenticate, authenticate with proxies, different methods, different uh, algorithms and so on. We have a lot of different options depending on which kind of algorithm your proxy uses, use the one that makes it go through. Typically, you control which proxy to use. You can control by setting um, environment variables. Basically, they control the scheme in the URL you're using. So basically, if you're going to HTTP colon slash slash, then it curl will check the HTTP underscore proxy environment variable. So like this, going to the HTTPS, it checks the HTTPS underscore proxy. The FTP checks the FTP underscore proxy. The HTTP HTTP underscore proxy. And as you can see, the HTTP one in lowercase, preferably uh, for reasons. <coughs> If, if none of them exist, there's also a fallback and check. Maybe there's an all proxy set and then it can use that. And it also checks the no proxy. Even if one of the above matched, if, if no, proxy, no proxy contains a list of exceptions, we should not use proxy for these host name patterns. I should also just, uh, let's not, go into this a lot, but there's also this difference. If, you, if you're if you talking HTTP through an HTTP uh, uh, proxy, you can, um, there's a, a double sort of request, right? You set up a request first to the proxy. Uh, if you do HTTPS through to the website, you set up a, first a connect request to the proxy and then a remote request through to the website. That means that you're sending headers to two different parties that are involved in the same transfer. And you s can separate headers to so curl can send headers just to the proxy or just to the website and you separate them or you differentiate between them using these proxy header or versus header just think about that if you you're setting headers when you're using http proxies okay this is going well where are uh, we're only 50 slides left <laughs> um <coughs> and now uh, of course http is one of those protocols that is uh, well when as we ask users every year which protocols are you using with curl people say http and hps i mean 95 99 percent of all users use these protocols and then the other protocols are much less used so these hps and http are by far the most by far the most popular and most frequently used protocols that curl supports and of course then in some ways the most important ones to, to curl and to curl users so some basics just about http there are different versions put it simply they're one two three um and hps uh, that's http and tls right it's the same sort of underlying protocol it's just uh, HTTP secured with TLS. So basically, sometimes that we then sort of use the words interchangeably a little bit, possibly a bit sloppy sometimes. Um, and then, um, th so basically it means there's a name resolve and you set up the TCP connection and then add TLS uh, handshake on that. Or when you use HTTP 3, you actually replace TCP and TLS with quick. It doesn't really matter. And then the protocol is a request response. So uh, you, s you ask for something, you get it back in just one ask, one response. And all, um, all requests that we send to, to servers, they, they have methods called verbs sometimes. Get, post, head, put, delete. Short words often spelled in uppercase. And this is how a very basic HTTP 1.1 request looks like. This is a get, get slash index.html. That's the resource it wants to get. Then the version of HTTP and then a set of headers. This just name, colon, value, set. Um, some of them needs to be there pretty much. Host pretty much needs to be there in a the request. The other ones uh, are often, I mean, optional. Some Sometimes you want them there for features and so on. Here's the user agent header. It basically says which client is asking for this. This is curl 2000. Very fancy uh, user agent. You can then the same thing but with a different method, different verb called head. This is then it looks identical uh, but it's the different uh, method. Or you can send the data to the server by sending a post in this case. Uh, and then the data then follows the headers. 
And as you can see here, the last header here says content length. That's actually the content of the data that follows. So hello, that's five bytes. Content length five. Uh, or a, a variation of uploading is put. Put is actually more replacing the resource. Post is posting data to that resource. Uh, semantic difference, but still there. So it's same thing there. It sends data in the request. Five bytes. It says hello. That's basically, and this is how HTTP 1.1 looks like. Um, I'll get back to slightly about different versions. Um, yeah, and here's a response. Uh, the other, the, the first four there are requests, and here's a response, right? 200 OK. Everything went fine. The server is example server. Here's the, there's five bytes of contents, and here's the type of the content. It's plain text. Hello. Five bytes, plain context. That's how, sort of, this is what HTTP one looks like so the, you set that verb or typically you uh, it depends on what kind of transfer you want to do by default curl makes a get request you can you can ask for a head request it doesn't provide any body at all just headers no body just give me just the head that's just the top part the headers uh, or you can send a post which contains some data you send to the server to that resource and you, we have then the dash D or dash capital F options. And we can upload data, which is the put. Replace the resource with this. You can actually send any verb with curl. Um, they're also sometimes abused. Sometimes you can uh, switch, uh, switch them around a little bit and, and you can tell curl to use whatever. Um, it's a little bit flexible and uh, HTTP is not a very, I mean, you can implement it in many different ways. You don't have to be very strict in following it. So sometimes you need to customize it a little bit. And then you use this dash X, whatever, so you can set whatever. Typically, and you will hear me say that a lot, this a lot in, in, in many circumstances, but typically you don't want to use dash capital X and you, you absolutely don't want to set it to get head post or put. But um, because if you do that, you're typically wrong so avoid it so when you want to get http headers in the terminal you get them bolded for example uh, and you're right and you get the uh, linkified location urls like this if you if you get the headers from curl.se like this you get them in bold and let me show you what it looks like if i um, bring out my terminal so basically uh, as the example slide shows you if i do go to curl and if I, if I, you know, there's no scheme here. There's just the scheme. So I can do this and you see the header names are in bold. I can also go to HTTPS colon slash slash. And then I got a, a HTTP2 instead of HTTP1. So all the headers are now lowercase, but they're also all bold. And uh, a fun part then is the... Um, uh, which, uh, all right, uh, if I do the one on HTTP, I get a location. And as you can see, that gets underlined when I move the mouse over it because it gets linkified. So if, you're, if you have the right terminal, uh, curl will um, show uh, use this as a sort of a magic uh, escape code. So it, it'll turn this into a proper link. And it, it sh the link should also work even when the url is relative here the the dash i here is actually done ahead so it makes a head request so it's the same thing so it's a capital i, I i'm sort of a bit damaged i always use the short version of course because i've done this a bazillion times but so that's what you do and um if you wanted to instead send a post to the server i could send a post a post data and then it would send these nine bytes to the server this server doesn't care about that, so it, it didn't do anything. Um, it just returned a redirect, right? So um, anyway, response codes, that's the two, number 200 in here. That's a typically a return code saying what kind of success it got back. 200 means fine. You get a 404 if the f it means a file not found. There's a whole plethora of them. You can re read up on what they mean. C 
important here is curl normally doesn't care about the uh, the response code basically if you get a 200 OK is back or you get a 404 file not found. It's the same thing for curl. It's actually a successful transfer and that people have a little bit hard time to grasp that at times. But if you ask for a file that doesn't exist, it's still a fine, fine transfer for curl. And I'll show you, for example, what that means. For let me, here's, you know, here's uh, the, the curl website. HTTPS colon slash curl. We want to get a uh, page somewhere. And if I would get the uh, I could get, I could get a, for example, the downloaded curl before, right? Curl eight two zero one tor, um, different extension this time. And I've, if I download this, you know, uh, it works fine, and I got it. But even then, even if I, you know, I, I yada, yada, not likely to exist on the server, right? Uh, because this is not actually a curl download. I, I just mistyped. This is a typo here in the URL. And I downloaded it. Look, it worked. And it worked. Why? Because, yeah, the transfer went fine. But, and, and I save this now as curl yada yada in, in my directory here. So if I look at curl yada yada, uh, that was, says, I think, 6,156 bytes. And it probably says something about. Uh, 404 file not found blah blah whatever you hoped you were going to get when so yeah it's a 404 page basically but successfully retrieved so it worked so curl did not return an error it said fine it worked keep that in mind and if you don't want that to happen you can use dash uh, lowercase f um, and then it is a dash dash fail actually in the long one. Then if you do the same thing with that, like this, if you if, then if you would do the yada yada, and like that, and you dash dash fail instead, you instead get an error because now now you told curl to care about it. Normally it does not care about it. And if you want to do more fancy things, remember I told you about this write out option dash w. So you can actually also, if you want to, uh, output the response code, for example, afterwards, uh, like this. Um, and I, I can show you that as well, of course. So if, if, for, if I, for example, did this and I wanted to, when I'm done with the transfer, show me response code, show me the response code after the transfer is completed. Uh, oh, there. So. To, comp to maybe combine with another option, silent, shut up about the progress meter, and just show me the response code, 404. It tells me that the transfer maybe was not to my satisfaction, or maybe I just wanted to test the error page and then it worked. So that's fun stuff. And uh, there's also, of course, response headers. So in all responses you get from an HTTP, you get headers back. And of course, you can see them with using just a verbose, op verbose option. I showed you dashed capital I, which makes a head. You can also use the lowercase I, which means include headers in the response. Sometimes not what you want. You can also use actually minus capital D to, to dump headers in a separate file. So there are many different ways. The response headers also describe the body and or the transfer. So the, the headers in a response, they have different responsibilities and they're sort of depending on what they're there for. You can see the difference, but they actually can both describe the resource and they can describe the transfer. Right, you can save them with dash and capital D in a, particular, in a separate file name if you want to save the header somewhere else. When you use the other HTTP versions than one, they will sort of still look the same as they did with one. So one, two, three, they look the same. Even if they actually don't look the same over the wire, we make them look the same for you. In response bodies, that's the response coming back from the server when you ask for something. That's sort of the data, the payload. So that's it usually has a content length. It can have a content length. It can also be done in many different other ways, like in chunked encoding, basically a chunk, 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 chunk. You then you don't know ahead of time how big it is, just a series of chunks coming. And with HTTP 2 and 3, basically, they can send data without 
chunking and without telling the size ahead of time and just tell then it just tells us when the data is done you can also ask for data to be compressed so basically uh, you know if you want to if you go back to my little example here uh, let's me say let's uh, let's ask for a proper download again we want to get this download the latest curl version i can add compressed to this command line and now when when doing this i will ask the server so if you can please compress the data when you send it to me and when i receive this it'll automatically uncompress the data and this actually works for anything right so i can do like this if i want to get the web page from the main page from the site save it to index.html but ask for it to get delivered compressed which basically then saves data right it makes it gets smaller um, gets compressed over the wire and then curl will automatically uncompress it in in my end so if i do like this i ask for it compressed and this time uh, i got 3000 bytes right um, and it's still 8500 bytes when uncompressed so we saved 5k from the transfer neat of course uh, in many cases you actually want that by default more or less and of course remember saving things you can save it to the lowercase o and the file name or uppercase o and it put, put, picks the name from the url there's this authentication in, in, F in HTTP, which basically means credential, right? So you want to prove that you have the right to get stuff. I mean, usually these days when you do web logins and things on the web, it's not done with HTTP authentication. Mostly because people want to control the login experience and things like that. So um, we, we will get to that in, in a second. But usually it, HTTP authentication, it, it's pretty much like when you get a 401 back from a server, it means I want authentication if it's a proxy, it returns 407. And it contains this. A server would then say, include this header and says, I, I can speak one of these different uh, uh, authentication methods. And then you would use one of those. And curl supports several of them. And you again, you use authentication like you've done with all the other protocols I mentioned already with a dash u user colon password. Typically, maybe you would use the n dash dash any auth, which says use the authentication um, that you know. Uh, sort of, it lets curl pick the best one out of the ones the server says it speaks. If curl can do one of them, usually it can. Otherwise, you can also say no, no, I want to use this specific uh, authentication method, basic digest and tell them negotiate. <coughs> you can also um, get data. You want to have look at the fun picture a piece of the pie you just want to get a little piece of a remote resource a really big file you just want the first uh, snippet out of it or uh, you want the range index five from five five byte 500 to byte 999 out of file.txt and just get that written in this case from to standard output uh, this has the unfortunate downside that the server can ignore your request and just deliver the entire thing anyway. You just wanted those 500 bytes, but you got those megabytes from the server. Uh, you can also use this resume function, which, which is just a slight variation of doing the same thing. You can resume my transfer from this index. Um, <clears throat> and as, as I mentioned, there are different versions of HTTP started out http was sort of created sometimes called invented in the 90s right in the early 90s or maybe late 80s um, so anyway the first uh, specification of http was called http 1.0 and that was in 1996 or 7 i want to say um, that was http 1 and sometimes then when people talk about what existed before that standard before http 1 people call that time the http 0.9 so therefore we have the 0 0.9 and we have 1.0 and 1.1 we have 2 and we have 3. curls can speak all of them http 3 is still experimental so usually people don't have that enabled yet so maybe in your version of curl you cannot enable http 3 just yet Hopefully we can do that soon. And generally you don't need to care about HTTP version if you just want to 
get or send stuff over HTTP, right? Crawl will just negotiate that for you and you can just ignore it. It'll work the same way, it's still act the same way. It's different over the wire. It's made sort of so that the user shouldn't have to care. If you want to let your curl speak 0 0.9, you have to tell it to do, to allow it. Because it's a bit of a weirdo thing when a server responds back with a 0 0.9. It's, it opens up for different mistakes and problems. So we don't want to do that unless you actually want to um, and you know what you're doing. If you want to go with one of those ancient versions, I said mid 90s protocol H.0, I want to go with that. Ask curl to do that. Otherwise, H.1.1 is a general default for HTTP. If you go with HTTPS, curl will try to go to HTTP2 if it can negotiate that in, in the handshake. And there's this um, experimental HTTP3 that you if you build with HTTP 3 support, you have to enable it or ask for it with this option. It won't use that otherwise. And how do you know which server, uh, ver which version the server supports? You can ask it or you can, again, the write out option has that info in the, in the variable called HTTP version. So if you connect to the server, ditch the output, just want to know the HTTP version, it's there in the write out option. And if you happen to run an HTTP3 enabled curl, you can actually also allow it to try HTTP3. And in this case, you will get 1.0, 1 1.1, 1 .1, 2 or 3, depending on what, what, what version this particular server speaks. In this exact case, with the curl.sc server, it su supports HTTP3, so it should say 3 if you have a 3 enabled curl. Otherwise, it should say 2 if you have a 2 enabled curl. And if you don't, you really should have, otherwise it'll say 1.1. When you do requests to a remote resource, you want to do you want to get a resource. You, uh, back to my cron job, you want to do you want to get something every day or every hour, every week. You can do the transfer maybe only if it's newer than a particular timestamp, right? Um, what about if the server is newer than, uh, if it's created or it has a modified time that is newer than September 1st, 2021, only then return it. If it's not newer, get it, give, it'll return a uh, 304 response code and nobody. Or you can reverse the condition, only if it's older than that, give me it. And then you, pref you just prefix the date with a dash, a single minus there. You can also even do new, if it's newer than the local file that happen, I happen to have here. So it's, if it's new and I, if it's done file name, it will pick, the, extract the date, the timestamp from that file, your local file, and use that as the time condition in the request. And, th and this is usually then also very neatly combined with if you use the dash R option called the dash dash remote time, I think, in the long version. If you use that option, when you uh, get a file, it'll use that remote file stamp and put it on your local file. So if you're if you're getting a file that was made in 2021 on September 1st, and you use dash r, your local file will also get that timestamp, September 1, 2021, which is convenient if you want to do it like one of these time-based things for your next request, checking if the file has updated. Is it newer than what I got the last time? Then uh, similarly, to, you can also do e tags. E tags is another way to do conditional things. Only get the data again if it's different than the last time. <coughs> you basically do this: uh, save the e tag for this resource this time, and your e tag save it into this file. In this fi in case, we call the file remember. So, if I get this file, remember the e tag here, and I, then I get it again tomorrow. Only get it if it's different than what I got yesterday, right? E tag save, E tag compare. So as long as it's the same that I already have, don't get it again. What if it's a super huge file? I don't want to get it again until I need to. So as long as it's the same. And uh, of course, you then want to do the convenient thing. So if it does update, you want to save the new update, right? So remember the new one if it's different. So only update if it's different. Uh, get the file if it's different, update the e-tag if you actually do download it. 
very convenient thing for automated things, your cron job that you do every day, every hour, every week, every year. It's no need to re-download it again if it's the same thing as it was the last time, because you already have it. And of course, I've mentioned TLS 24 bazillion times in, in this talk already, but HTTPS is HTTP with TLS for security, right? So th there's really no difference in use, typically. You just add that S and you have TLS and everything is fine and dandy. Uh, it'll automatically negotiate whatever for you and even try HTTP 2 by default if it can. It'll sort of ask the server if it can. If it doesn't, it'll stick to 1.1. And HTTP 3, the next or the newest version of, of HTTP will only ever be done over HTTPS because there is no clear text version of HTTP 3. It will only um, be done over HTTPS. So if you ever want to do HTTP 3, you have to make sure that you speak HTTPS because otherwise you don't have to even try it because it won't use it. It can't. So anyway, I, going forward, um, HTTP POST, that's a way to send data to your server, right? And, and sending data to a server, it's really, you can send anything. There's no, there's no limitation here. You can send a single byte, a bazillion number of bytes, and, and the bytes can be in any order, in any form. We don't know what it is. Could be, f you know, code, even use film. Uh, we don't know, we don't care. It's just data, bytes over the wire. Typically, you, if you, if you want to do it easy, you send it with the dash D option, it's also, also called dash dash data in the long form. Basically, here's a string of data that you want to send to the server. It is often, as I mentioned already before, done in this uh, name equals value pairs separated by ampersands. So in this case, name is admin, shoe size is 12. Uh, it's a standard sort of way to provide it. Well, I shouldn't say standard, but it is it's a common way to do it. <clears throat> so you will see that this is very, very, very commonly used everywhere. So you just so send this data to the server. Um, you can also split it up in multiple dash Ds and curl will put it together automatically for you so that you don't have to think about it. It's very, it, it makes it nicer perhaps when you create command lines or write scripts. You don't have to sort of mush everything together if you don't want to. Um, or you can read the data off a file name so you don't have to put it all in the command line. We could put the data to send in a file or you know read it from standard in. Or you can even sort of make sure that if you, uh, I, you know, in this third example, when reading from a file name, if you have to specify that by an at sign in the beginning, at file name. Someone then pointed out to me that what if you want to send data that starts with that at symbol? So then we had to create the option called data raw that doesn't read from a file ever. So you can send, it can begin with an at symbol <laughs> without a problem. Uh, you know, that's how, how things are. and. Uh, if you if you want to actually read everything from a file strictly, including all uh, new lines exactly as they are, you can use the data binary option. So a lot of different ways to send data. <coughs> uh, more things about posting. Posting is, is a big part of, of curl, right? It's a very popular common thing, sending data to a server. It's fun, it's good, it's convenient. And when you send data, data with dash D, it defaults, it sets a content type. The content type is supposed to describe whatever are you sending. Usually, many servers don't care about the content type. It doesn't matter what the content type is. They just expect some data to come and they will sort of uh, assume that the client is sending the data in the right uh, way. So <coughs> that's... Um, but curl sets this content type because it's this sort of default way to send post x www form url encoded a hint about that the data is supposed to be url encoded but you can change that right just set whatever content type you want um, and you can do that as a test if you want to your service and see if they care about it or not most and you'll see that most services will not care about it some will um and of course recently within the last uh, decade. I don't remember. Five years ago, I don't run. I, we added s s also extra new support as a sort of an alias to dash d dash dash data to to better send JSON. So if you want to send JSON like this, here's name Daniel in a JSON style. I'm not really a JSON guy, but I the, uh, so I write this sort of 
JSON looking things and I say it's JSON. So come on. Uh, it's JSON, right? Uh, so uh, if you do this, it's, it puts this data and it says that it's JSON. It sets the right headers and makes it look proper JSON to the server. And you can do the same thing there. You can read the JSON from a file from disk and send it to the server and you can send it, you know, standard input as a JSON and so on. And it sets these, this content type header and an accept header because it turns out that quite a lot of JSON uh, receiving ends at least uh, then checks these content types and accepts. So basically just a convenient shortcut to send JSON. You could send JSON fine before that, but now it's even easier because it's less options to use. Uh, right, uh, it, and if you want to create JSON to send, I can also uh, only encourage you to try out the, uh, the command line tool, tool called JO as a sort of a companion tool to JQ, JSON output maybe. I don't know. It, it makes it, it makes it easier to create a JSON object like, like this on the command line. Just JO, and I don't know JO either, but it, this creates a JSON object, passes it on to curl. Curl reads the JSON from standard input, as you see the at dash thing, and sends the JSON with the right headers and everything to the server. Really neat. And if you want to then do the other way around, when you get JSON back from the server, sometimes all, or perhaps often, you send JSON to the server, you get JSON back and, and you want to parse that. Uh, you of course know that there's this awesome tool called JQ that is a perfect tool for you to parse J, uh, JSON with and pretty print it and, and extract it and do whatever. It's, it's a very powerful tool. So you, if you get JSON back, pipe it into JQ. And then you of course can do the magic triplet Use JO, use JO, create a JSON, send it to curl, send it to the server, get JSON back, pass it on to the JQ. Awesome set, uh, success, win, profit, everything. So when you do this, these are um, usually URL, as I mentioned before, the default is the URL encoded content types. So usually, usually you send stuff URL encoded. URL encoded meaning you encode everything that uh, is part of the data uh, that can't be part of URL, you encode it as a percent encoding, like percent two digits, which is the ASCII or byte number for, for the byte. So basically, if you want to send name John Doe, uh, you know, percent, uh, so sorry, parenthesis junior, you know, with some spaces and some parentheses and stuff here, uh, and you want it to be URL encoded and you want to post it to the server. Then we have the data URL encode option that does it for you. It'll then send this blob over to the server because it'll URL encode all the stuff that's not safe to put in a URL, which means in this case, the spaces and the parentheses. So, and you see they get encoded to their uh, URL encoded versions, which is a percentage sign and two digit hexadecimal bytecode. And you can do, uh, do this in, in several different versions as you can encode content and you can sort of encode the name and you can read the content from a file and you can URL encode contents directly from a file and so on. So it's, uh, it's a powerful thing. It helps you send data URL encoded in particular from, from the command line when you maybe get data that is not properly URL encoded and you need to send it URL encoded. You could do this. Um, you can also then create everything for a post and then convert it to a get. This is this is super crazy. But if you do it like this, you want to send a post with the admin and shoe size. This is example I used from the before, right? But convert it into a get and put that data instead of doing a post, make it query a query part in the URL. So basically, you add dash dash get and ill done use that as a query part in the URL and make a get instead as then the request will look like this. It's a super crazy th thing. Basically, r r don't make it a post, get the data and m convert it into query parts instead and instead make it a get with that query. I really recommend you using URL query instead. This data get thing is an older invention uh, created a long time ago. I think URL query is a much more convenient way and a better way to do the building the query part and more powerful actually too. When sending data to a server over HTTP, 
actually over HTTP 1.1, there's this concept of ex called expect 100 continue. Basically, it's a me it's a way to allow the server to because with HTTP 1.1, when you start to send data, there's no way to really stop sending the data without sort of killing the connection. So if you want to send a lot of data to the server, you want to give the server a way to say, wait a minute, we don't want it. Stop. Don't send me any data. Uh, you, you're not allowed to until blah, 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 or something like that. So there's this notion that you can send expect 100 continue, which asks the server to say, please tell me uh, everything was, uh, is okay, and then I will continue. So, and curl will use this. If you're telling curl to upload something that is larger than one megabyte, uh, it's actually in some other cases as well. But basically, if you're going to send a lot of data to the server, curl will add this header. If we add this header, we, the, the server is supposed to tell you, go ahead. Sometimes the server doesn't know about this. It'll just don't say anything. So then curl will wait a while. Oh, didn't get any thumbs up. I will go ahead anyway. So it waits for a 100 to say, go ahead. If it wait, it waits for a while, and if it doesn't get a, get a go ahead, it will go ahead anyway. <laughs> Sometimes, if you know that it won't get that, you can skip it. Basically, ask curl to don't use that header because we will not get the hundred uh, continue. So you can avoid uh, wasting time. You can also send data without knowing the size ahead of time. We can basically force curl to send a chunk encoding data for one dot one server it's basically it's a way to send data by just chunk 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 without sending the total size ahead of time a convenient way um, to do it sometimes and it, especially if you send data from standard input or something when you don't actually know the data so basically when you when you a browser sends a post it does that uh, as as a sort of a, a response to a form tag in html typically and a post is then a sort of filling in the form and sending the form results back to the server. That's that's the typical way to do a post, or that's how browsers do post. And when they do that, they include all the the, the types, the sort of in HTML there's input tags, and they can be type hidden, so they're not actually visible in the web page, but they're data that are sent to the server anyway. And you just provide all the input fields like this when you want to fake a when it look like a you're submitting a form as a browser. Uh, right, and you need to um, check then because there's a action equals target in the uh, form tag in the HTML. It actually says where, what's the target to send the post to. And again, copy as curl is really your friend. Check what it, your browser does. When, it's, when you submit a form and you want to do the same form with curl, do the copy as curl and check what kind of uh, request the browser did. And then go from there. A, a post can also be more complicated. You can send a more a more formatted, a more sort of structural way to send data to the server. I call it a multi-part form post. Um, that sends a, a number of parts in a structured way to the server. It has a different content type. It says multi-part form data. Um, it's a number of series of parts, one or more. It can actually be an unlimited number of parts, uh, usually a low number, but there's no restriction to the number. And each part has a name. It has sep its own set of headers, file name and more. And uh, the, it's a, they're, they're separated by MIME boundaries. I'll show you how it looks like. Basically like this. There's first a MIME, a MIME boundary. That's the line with dashes and a random number. It's basically just a random thing. It's a random thing. It's a separator. Um, and then there's, there are headers for this part. In this case, it says name equals person. And then there's content for this person, anonymous. That's the content for this part. And then a new boundary, which so the next part starts and that's new part. It says name secret and that has a file name because it's a file attachment, basically. It's a file name. So it has a content type, text plain. And then there's contents of that file. And then there's another MIME boundary. And this MIME boundary has uh, actually ends with two dashes, which means it's the final one. So this is two parts, a two-part multi-part form, uh, multi-part form post. 
post. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is how it looks like. And, and th this is typically how you do file uploads with browsers or when, whenever you you know you get the file selector to select an image or a file or something you upload it that's how a browser does it and that's how you can do it with curl as well and if you want to do it with curl you use the dash capital f option and you do sort of specify what kind of content for each part you want to upload so and you do as many parts as you want you can i mean there's no limit to how many you, you do them so it could be that simple person is uh, um, anonymous it could be name is daniel it could be name reading the content from a file it could be so sort of faking a file upload it's sort of you get the name as a file here and it, it'll set it as a file name in the in the multipart form so it looks like a f like one of those upload of file things and you can set a different file name in the upload uh, or sort of in the post than that you actually use to read from and you can set a different content type and there's a plethora of different uh, alternative options here basically th this is how to sort of do the same things that the browsers do when they get this enc type multipart form data thing in the form tag very convenient and uh, powerful so when do you use dash d or dash f two different kinds of posts right different contents different ways to do them both sends http posts both work um, over any http version and both sort of can fill in forms the form tag uses different you know, i mean you can see in the form tag which different kind the server expects um, and you can rarely just pick anyone you want it's typically the server who decides because the server has you know code in the other end that uh, checks stuff and parses and decodes stuff and it usually doesn't you know handle either or it'll want one of them and you need to pick the one that it wants for success at least uh, yeah, and you know, maybe this is not news to anyone, but HTTP also has this re redirect concept. So basically, instead of returning the data right now, it has, has it doesn't, it actually is not here, it's over there. And it's a three zero something response code, in this case, a 301. And, and there's, it's a location header in there. So the location says it's actually over there now. Go look there. And there are different response codes. Uh, the different response codes are different, actually different time scopes, and you act differently. Uh, you, you modify the method differently when you follow the redirect. So the, the the response code is actually it matters, but usually you don't have to think about it. You just if you just ask ask curl to get this resource and you get a location like uh, you get a response code three three oh one back, you get ask got it back. Uh, if you add this dash dash location option, that's capital L, it'll ask curl to follow that redirect over to the follow the location, uh, wherever it points, and it'll do that. So in this case, very easy. This is uh, this web page, curl, um, curl, capital L, curl dot se, right? And this is using HTTP and since the site says, oh, if you're on HTTP, redirect to the HTTPS version. So if you see, see contents here now, we see that it actually followed the redirect. And if we use dash V, we can, and if we can even, you know, hide the output, just use the verbose output. And then we scroll up a little bit, and then we can see that it first connect, uh, the connected to the uh, plain text version, it got a lo new location and then it got blah, 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 issue another request to this URL and then got the dev other one. And of course you can m set a maximum number of redirects to follow because uh, sometimes it, it'll end up in a loop. So it'll just never stop following redirects. Um, so it can be convenient to set the max number. <coughs> and if you're using credentials or sending a username like you know username password typically that password and username will not be passed on to other host names other than the first and used the one used in the first request but sometimes you want it to be transferred to the ones you're following then you use this location trusted instead uh, and you really want to avoid the dash capital x 
I mentioned this before, but in particular in combination with location, you, you will get sad faces all over if you try that. Uh, it's not going to be fun. So avoid dash capital X. And when you want to play with a request, of course, you can do all sorts of fun things, but you should remember that curl tries to be sensible and basic by default. You know, if you use curl and the URL, it makes a get by default. You, do, you don't ask for get to be used, it's just there. If you use curl dash D uh, and send in post, it, it'll do a post by default. You don't have to ask for it. But it also means that it'll be in sort of a no frills version. So if you want to do, uh, if you want to add bells and whistles, you have to tell curl to add stuff. You can modify along, uh, like you can modify the method with request. If you want to send a delete uh, method, do dash dash request delete and it'll send a delete instead of a get by default. You can change headers with the dash dash header option. You can add headers, you can change headers, you can remove headers and you can send blank headers with dash dash header. Um, that's the short version is called dash um, uppercase capital H, right? Like this. Send in this example here includes the new header curl master very soon to this in this request. Very useful, uh, maybe not, but who knows? You could actually add a useful header, but you can also do like this. This is, I mean, by default, curl will send the host header, but if you set your own host header, you will replace the one that curl would use by default. So if by setting one that curl would use, you override it and you say, hey, use my version instead. I know better, this is going to be fun. And you can provide a completely wrong one. Or you can do it like this. If you don't provide any content on the right side of the colon, like this, user agent colon, you say, you tell curl to um, don't use your own version. In fact, don't use any at all. It just remove this he uh, header from the default request. So you'll send the same request, except this particular header. Um, and you can of course combine everything of this in the same request if you want to. And if you use this magic little trick and use a semicolon instead of a colon, basically user agent semicolon, it means send this header, but with a blank content on the other side of the colon. So basically no, no value for this header, which is rather unusual, but uh, still you can do it. It's fun. And you can do a modify the request in other ways. For example, the target is called the thing, uh, the thing, but when you do a web uh, HTTP request, basically what you're asking for is a path plus query, right? In this case, slash user slash profile, quest, question mark, shoe size equal 12. That's the target. This made, it comes from the URL, right? That's the target. What's the ask? You ask the server for this. And you can, if you want to, you can set that target to something more crazy than, <laughs> than you can set in the URL. For example, if you want to send a request target that is just an asterisk, it's not possible to actually set just an asterisk in the URL because it's always a slash in there. So if you want to send options asterisk to this server, here's how you do it. Um, there's also some convenient shortcuts. Like if you want to set user agent, you don't have to do a uppercase H setting header, this, this user agent, and then set a string. It even has a short version called dash capital A. You can set a referrer um, and referrer is another header. Yes, it's spelled wrong, but uh, it's a way to tell the, when you get a resource, you can tell I came from this other place. The, the other place redirected me here when I got, or sort of I followed a link from there. Usually sort of um, maybe privacy leaks, but so use it with with care, but that's at least a convenient thing. And again, copy as curl, and you can know you can sort of learn how the browser would do it, and then edit that line and and do have fun. Put is the more uploady thing. Pretty much, it's it's HTTP's lingo <coughs> to replace a remote remote resource, right? Put my file here remotely, the entire file over there. Post is more sending data to another place. Put is sending, sort of replacing the file over there. And you, you do the upload as you do without all the other protocols with curl like this. Um, you can do it from standard in. You can put the file and if the file name is not at the end of the URL, like in this case, you see the URL doesn't end with a file name. It will put the local file name on the end of the uh, URL. 
<clears throat> you can even do this globbing thing with the upload. So if you want to upload a hundred, a thousand actually, a thousand images like this in a single command line, have a go at it and it'll upload 1000 uh, images to the as puts. And uh, well, yeah, you can do that with the other kind of globbings as well. And if you want to do fancy, you want to go crazy, you can use that uppercase X uh, as I've told you not to. But if you want to do, you know, provide the data to put with dash D, which otherwise would do a default to post, you can actually check, change the post to put like this. So you can be creative with curl and uh, no worries. So, <clears throat> okay. When you do, when you work with uh, the your random servers these days, you also want to speak cookies, right? Cookies is a way for a server to send key value pairs to the client. You access something on the server, and and the server tells the client save this, and the curl will uh, sorry the client will send it back on subsequent requests on some conditions, right? When the properties match, and curl supports this of course each cookie has an expiration date um, or a sort of or end of session so it lives for a while or end of session there's also a session is kind of not defined what is a session uh, typically a session end when a user clo closes the browser but these days like but there's a lot of browsers that never close so basically those sessions never ends but but, but anyway that's sort of that's a se uh, cookie session. It's it's a little bit weird, but that's ignore that. But that's just how it. Don't ignore it, but uh, just keep it in mind. So, so when you run a command curl command line, right, that sort of mimics a browser or, or does a lot of things. Uh, when does the session end? It doesn't really end, right? There's no session for for uh, when you do 22 different curl command lines. But maybe you want it. You you should still be able to tell curl that let's mimic a browser close basically. I'll get to it. Uh, you'll understand. It's not that complicated. So basically, you can tell curl to send specific cookie names with values because it's fun. Usually, you don't actually know exactly what to send, but maybe you you want to send that the cookie that calls my name is Daniel. I talk a lot. To the example, yes, easy peasy, just specific uh, uh, cookie. Uh, that's really what you want to do, uh, but you can do that. And, and often that's exactly how you get the command line from copy as curl, because it will save exactly the cookie it would send you, uh, it would have sent. It's rarely the way you want it, because you actually rather wanted to send the cookie contents that you got in a previous request. Not this exactly every time, but the last one, because it's going to be dynamically updated, right? So usually you want to do it like this. First, of course, curl ignores cookies by default, so <laughs> you want to sort of enable cookies, and you do that, we call it cookie engine, sort of enable it, and you enable it by, for example, specify a file to read from, or use a blank string, and you can use the b dash b again here, so by doing this, you enable the cookie engine, and in this case, of course, it doesn't really matter, but just you just get one file, you don't save the cookies anywhere, so it doesn't matter if you enable cookies here. But if you would follow redirects here, um, then it's a good thing because then you enable redirects, enable cookies, and then if this then the first page sets cookies, read redirects to the second page, and curl will then send cookies in the in the second request if they should be sent. Um, and keep the cookie engine then keeps those cookies in memory related to this, of course, um, and it. Uh, <coughs> it forgets cookies automatically then that that expires if any expires i mean they, they set a time right so if if the process process is slow and there's a short expiration time they will expire while curl handles them so sort of it follows the rules it abides by the rules it does what it should do for cookies and of course it only sends them back according to the rules because that's how cookies work right they're defined uh, and when you want to save them curl saves them. We save them in what we call a cookie jar. That's the, that's the storage we save cookies in. And you, when you exit, when curl exits, when it's uh, it's done, you can ask curl, save everything, save all the cookies in the bra uh, in the cookie jar. I'm getting, <laughs> I've talked a lot now. Uh, okay, uh, so w when curl is done, save all the cookies in the cookie jar. And you do, and you tell curl to do that with the dash C option. 
So basically like this, in this example, follow redirects. Enable the cookie engine by by the this default read nothing, and then save at the end of the session. Save everything to cookies.txt if there is anything to save. If there were no cookies set, it will not save anything. It will just be a blank file. <coughs> and by uh, by, I, I just want to emphasize then that since dash b and dash c they both take file names. So you can make it read from one file and write to another file. Or they could be the same file. Usually they're the same file. You don't have to have them the same file. I just wanted to sort of remember that. Uh, so usually when you when you play around with this, you, uh, you set the, uh, dash B and dash C to the same file name because it's then it reads the old cookies from the file. If it updates them, it'll update, it'll re rewrite the new ones, uh, or the current new set to the file back again, just over and over. So you can have that in your cron job and your scripts and like this, do some, sort of do this every time and it'll just maintain the cookie state correctly in, in the cookies.txt file. Uh, <coughs> It uses the so the so-called Netscape cookie format. Uh, we call it like that because Netscape, the browser, actually sort of created that cookie file format once in the 90s. It was used for a while by other browsers, but the browsers then switched away from that. But curl did not switch away from that. So curl still uses that. It's a very simple text-based format where each cookie is a single line with tab separations. And okay, and as I mentioned, there are session sessions then. So some cookies are stored sort of for a session. They, they don't have any specific expiration date. They, sort of, they live for a session. So you have to tell curl when the session ends. When does the session end? In curl, you don't actually tell when the session ends. You tell when there's a new new session. So we have this new session. Uh, we have this option called dash dash junk session cookies. It's, I believe it's, could be a short option for that. Yeah, the dash capital J. It basically says load all cookies again, uh, with dash B, yes, normally, but throw away all session cookies because the, the session is now gone. This is a new one. So all the old, the ones that we already have, they are part of the past session. They're gone. Throw them out. This is, I mean, you actually rarely use this, but this is a way to sort of clean up the, the, the session cookies. Okay, I told you before that HTTP versions are rarely that much to care about. It's just, it'll just be used by defaults and, and sort of automatically. And version two changed how things are sent over the wire, but, uh, but it's typically hit, curl doesn't really show that it tries to hide it it converts everything and makes it look like http1 as, as it looked like before um, it tries to negotiate http2 for all https and you can make it use http2 or try to use http2 even for http transfers if you just ask it to it's sometimes a recipe for disaster so uh, maybe not uh, go uh, board and do it too much basically because of how I mean, the internet and servers work, not because of what curl does. And if you have the opportunity to do use HTTP2, the good part with HTTP2 is that it can do multiplex transfers, so meaning it can do multiple transfers over the same connection. So if you do multiplex transfers using the capital Z, you know, many transfers at the same time, if you use HTTP2, it might actually use multiplex transfers. So it doesn't have to, even when you do 50 parallel transfers, it doesn't have to do 50 parallel connections. It can do much fewer connections, hopefully, possibly, in the ideal case. And HTTP 3 being the new kid in, 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 in town then, it's still experimental, so you don't have it enabled by default. You have to enable it in your build. Most people don't do it. We discourage people from using it in production. It's changed again how it's done over the wire, right? So it's now done over quick. It's not TCP, it's not TLS, it's now quick. It's a new transport protocol done over UDP. It replaces TCP and TLS. It's a completely new thing. Everything is different. It's even more encrypted, hides more, um, uh, hides more things over the wire. But again, the fact 
that it is so different over the wire and different in many kinds in many ways it's sort of hidden to the users of the curl tool so you don't have to care about it it's only for the STPS, as uh, I mentioned before, and you can ask curl to use HTTP3 or attempt to use HTTP3 if you use this option, dash dash HTTP3. And we have this fun race when you use this. So HTTP3 ra races against the older HTTP versions and you pick the winner. You, n you remember I mentioned the happy eyeballs thing when, when we sort of race a IPv4 versus IPv6 when we do a connection. So we had the white IPv6 car and the red IPv4 four car and the one that sort of wins the race gets the connection. And now when we ask for HTTP3, we add another dimension to this. And, and uh, let me show you. Oh, right. I forgot to mention that too. So if you do this, if you do this multi uh, again, multiplexed transfers work with HTTP3. So if you use parallel transfers, it could do multiplexed transfers. Same as uh, for HTTP2 but different connections. So HTTP3 racing, fun stuff. So then we have this curl client laptop again. It, wanted, it wants to talk to curl.se. It resolves the host name from the DNS. It's get that uh, huge list of HTTP, sorry, sorry, IP addresses. As I mentioned, eight IPv6 addresses, four IPv4 addresses. And it then starts the, uh, the HTTP3 IPv6 car and it got it gets then all the IPv6 addresses to try try to do HTTP3 which then means over quick for IPv6 to this and and slide with a slight delay we start the HTTP3 IPv4 car which gets a set of IPv4 addresses to try try to set up quick to this these addresses and and again, then slightly after uh, delayed a little bit more, we set up the HTTP2 IPv6 uh, attempt. And then if slightly b b after that, we set up the HTTP2 IPv4 attempt. So the IPv4 attempts here used IPv4 addresses and the IPv6 attempts used IPv6 addresses. And the first who wins, then wins. And all the, the ones that sort of didn't win, they will get discarded and, and thrown away. It, it gives um, H3 a small edge because in this case, you asked for HTTP3 support, right? So you, you wanted it to be HTTP3, but in case of HTTP3 gets problems, it's slow, it's bad. Uh, the HTTP3 cars will not succeed. And then the fastest HTTP2 car will win instead. And in this case, I mentioned HTTP2 cars here because HTTP2 in this case is a negotiation between H1 and H2. So it'll pick H1 or H2 uh, depending on uh, what the server can speak. Fun stuff, rather complicated, but it works really well uh, in in reality, and it makes it makes so that curl picks the one that works and is the fastest to answer. In HTTP, we also have other fun things getting really into the weeds of the HTTP details. We have this, I like this finger pointing over there because this is the old service. Uh, the same service also exists over there. It's an alternative service over there. It's like that finger pointing. So it's over there for a certain number of seconds into the future. And it's uh, old service response header. And this is how um, the server can say that I also exist over here, possibly a different version, a different uh, source, uh, place, host name, and so on. It has an expiry time and it's uh, only over HTTPS, but um, curl can then save these alternatives and you can ask curl to use these alternatives in your follow up request. So basically save the alternatives now, do a second request, use the alternatives, and then you can go to the, sec to the sort of like this saved alternatives if there are alternatives this time use them so then you might not go to the same server anymore and could go to a completely different host name because example.com told us that there's an alternative that <coughs> it wants us to use pretty neat thing this is the official way to switch to http 3 uh, that's how the standards mandate uh, things to do so once you have http 3 support in curl you might want to do it this way it's a text-based uh, readable file uh, you can read it, you can edit it, you can do whatever you want. <coughs> you can also um, uh, s 
a slight variation of the old service is might uh, you can say is the HSTS thing, which is high uh, this HTTP strict transport security, which is a way to for the server to tell c the client to tell curl don't contact me over clear text HTTP anymore for this amount of time into the future. Basically, it's a way to, so as I showed you before, how curl, when I uh, access curl.se with HTTP, HTTP being an unauthenticated, insecure protocol, we want to avoid going to using clear text protocols. So we don't want to go with a clear text protocol to have that upgraded to HTTPS because that HTTP face is an insecure weak point, right? So once we've done that once, we can save the HSTS data that says we should never, for this host name, we should never speak clear text again un until this expires. And it, the service says this with this strict transport security response header and curl will save that in a file if you ask it to, and then you can tell curl to use it. And then it'll, in this case, if, if we had saved that HSTS data for this example.com site, and we use this HSTS cache, it will not go to the uh, over clear text again. It'll then automatically internally switch to the HTTPS version. That's avoiding clear, clear text, that's avoiding the insecure part and insecure as uh, sort of avoiding the attack risk or the vulnerable, vulnerable point in time where someone could eavesdrop or interfere or do something bad. And it, that again is a, is a text-based file that curl saves and, and reads data back from. <clears throat> right. We're we're on three and a half hours, so uh, slightly over time. But uh, as you can see here, down at the bottom right, uh, we are only twelve slides away from the end. I hope you all are hydrated, uh, awake, or or so. <clears throat> so I think by by reaching the end of HTTP, we also reached the end of the, of the you know, the super popular protocols that, that people use curl with. But oh, I still wanted to get into it. FTP is still used by a uh, two digit uh, percentage of, of users, at least when I asked them. So I wanted to get into some details with FTP. FTP being a little bit of a lag legacy protocol, it's not used much. It's uh, sort of, you know, possibly slowly dying and dwindling away, but uh, still, First, I want to emphasize, because this is so common, you know, FTPS is not SFTP. It's the same letters in a different order, but they're completely different. That's an apple, that's an orange. They are different. Do not confuse them. They're, they're actually, it actually matters in which order you put the letters. <laughs> they're, they're super different. One is done with TLS, one is done with SSH. Uh, they actually have basically nothing in common apart from them using the same letters in the acronym. Uh, it's not an acronym, is it? Uh, it's an abbreviation or whatever it is. Uh, okay, first, what makes FTP funny, weird, strange, complicated, ugly, yet super annoying to work with is that it uses two connections to do transfers. Yes, two. How does it do two connections and why? Well. Basically, you set up when you you communicate when you want to do a transfer. The curl connects to the FTP server. It first sets up a, s a connection and it speaks to the server. It authenticates, says hello, and you log in and it chain communicates. And then it has to set up a second connection to do the actual transfer. And this second connection adds complications for everyone involved, for firewalls, for network setups, for, for uh, there's an insecure part in it. So it's really, really difficult to manage. Um, and n n <laughs> so if that is not enough, you can do that second connection two different ways. You can do it in the uh, active way or the passive way. So you can ask the server to connect to you or you to connect to the server for that second transfer. The passive way is default and it is default just because it's a higher chance of actually working while active is even less <laughs> of a chance to work because uh, I'll show you. It works like this. 
look at that, the client curl laptop wants to talk to the FTP server. There's actually no FTP server on that host name, but it doesn't matter, it's an example. So when it does that, you know, it curl connects over the network, on the it sets up the control connection to the server, exactly like it does for any other protocol, you know, TCP to the server over there. It, it actually does as this, it's, uh, it's one of these I call ping pong protocols because there's a lot of command and response, command and response several times back and forth to, to instruct the server to do things. And then to do the transfer, we either do the tra set up the connection to the server or from the server, passive or active. And if we want the server to connect back to us, that is usually a problem because we have firewalls, routers, network equipment, whatever. It's really hard to allow the server to connect back to the client because the client is usually beyond a lot of fluffy networky stuff. So it's complicated. Anyway, both of them are complicated. In th this, FTP is basically always authenticated. Typically, curl uses the default anonymous user and this password called FTP at example.com. Um, but it doesn't matter if it's basically anonymous, right? But you set the user password like normal, like all the other protocols like this with curl. Um, if you if you have if you want it to be authenticated, typically if you want to upload with FTP, you have to log in first, and you can do direct listings with uh, FTP, and then you just uh, add a trailing slash because curl doesn't really know what is a directory, if what's the file name. If you don't add that trailing slash on, on the, like this, there's a trailing slash here. It means that it's a directory, so curl will make a directory listing out of this. But if you don't add the slash there, you just add uh, with Linux, uh, curl thinks that's a file name. So it'll ask for that file to get transferred, which if it's actually a directory will just cause failure. And if you get a directory listing, you will notice that that's not a standardized look. It, it might look completely different on, a complete, on, on another server. It's just basically the server doing something you know, to providing a human readable directory list, which is super annoying if you want to parse that directory with a machine. You can make it slightly better by asking for list only, which is a different command that you send to the server, which then only lists the file names in that directory, which makes it a little bit easier, but there's still lots of cave caveats and, and FTP is, is a weird protocol in general. It's uh, old and weird. And if you want to upload, again, curl dash capital T, you normally want to be uh, have a user uh, name and, and password because servers rarely allow that for anonymous users. And again, you put the file name at the end and so on. With FTP, you can also append to the remote file, right? By adding dash dash append, it will not only upload to that file on the other side, it will ask the server to append this local data to the remote file. And you can also create file uh, directory uh, sort of files on the remote side. So to create a directory hierarchy on the other side. So if you want to upload this and some of those directories are not existing remotely, try to create them when you do this upload operation. And of course, you want to go with TLS. Always go with the authenticated version of all the protocols and then you add this SSL required uh, to the command line. And then you can still keep using the FTP colon. It doesn't have an S in the URL scheme, right? But it, SSL required means that it's required to upgrade into t TLS or fail. So you can be sure that it will still use FTPS sort of the secure version. You can also use FTPS colon slash slash, but that's called to use implicit TLS. Um, and, and that's actually rarely supported by servers. So you will see that you can try it with your server, but you, it will most likely fail because that's another way to do it, more of a non-standard way. FTPS is even more problematic for, for the firewalls and stateful firewalls. You know, the second connection coming back or going out is even more complicated because in the FTPS case, when, when, when you have an um, encrypted control channel, no one can actually even then know when to open which ports and so on, which you could otherwise see in the FTP communication. But with FTPS, that's completely impossible. So it makes it even less likely to actually work. So FTPS, really difficult to get to work. Um, in general, unless, I mean, within your networks and stuff, in, in more controlled environments, sure. But over the internet, complicated and, and 
now we are on slide 149 and we are tired by now right i think we probably dropped about everyone in the chat all the listeners are gone but <coughs> never mind the future first of course let me just remind you get back to the facts that how do you get into this deeper so curl is of course everything sort of it's accumulated results and experience from from a lot of time a lot of experiments a lot of testing and a lot of uh, uh, user reports so it's every, it's not always very easy to understand sort of um, everything because it's sort of we've changed we did things from the beginning that maybe wasn't done in the most clever way and so when we do things again we make them in a better way but then you might see that it's a little bit inconsistent so maybe we added a, a feature back in the days and now when we add this roughly the next generation of the same thing it's slightly different and that's why because of that we learned things we were we were all kids in the beginning now we understand a little bit more so things are actually done better now but then and also thanks to the fact that we we don't break behaviors right so we added that s slightly crazy option 22 years ago we still support that slightly crazy option today because we decided to to keep the functionality right um, so that's one reason why some things are a little bit sort of maybe not ideal but uh, for, for the greater part of things are there and, and also that's also we've been at it for a while so we have 257 options now so read the man page read every uh, i mean don't read it search in them and find exactly what you want to read don't read everything uh, and tell us if you find any problems and there's of course you can always go down to the source code and you can always ask anyone uh, if you if it doesn't help if you don't find the problems uh, yeah, I mentioned everything curl. This is the URL, everything.curl.dev. It's really, uh, I shouldn't say complete. It's never going to be complete, but I'm trying to cov cover pretty much all functionality. I'm sh pretty much sure everything I mentioned today in, in my super long video is is detailed even more in the book. So if, if you didn't understand it, if, if my talk was incomprehensive or, or just Go there and read a book and and if you still don't understand it ask and we will clarify and it will be better in the next uh, commit so i want to just go out and emphasize and sort of curl uh, we celebrated 25 year curls and uh, earlier this year of course, uh, of course as i mentioned curl was also just the third name of this project so <laughs> it actually existed before it was curl but still curl the name the project we didn't call it the pro curl project until it was named curl so it's 25 years old we, we, it's been growing and developed for 25 years its entire lifetime it has changed there's a development speed that is increasing still increasing after 25 years so that combined with the fact that the internet doesn't really stop or slow down. I mean, it keeps changing. Uh, we don't do things today like we did even five years ago. So compared to 15 years ago, things are different. So curl needs to keep up. So if we want to do internet transfers with curl, we need to keep up and modifying and improving curl all the time, right? Because protocols and new ways of doing things change all the times. I mean, new versions, systems, concepts, everything changes. And I mean, there's no slowdown. In, in in general internet development right or anything in the world with things typically don't slow down really it's you know it just things keep moving so we have to keep up and keep moving with with everything around us so reasonably we will keep doing this and we will keep expanding and adding stuff and and everything i've said today i mean there's a risk that it will feel outdated in a while because we will keep adding things and keep changing things and improving things and we do whatever we think we should do right i i i like to say that curl is just code right it's just code we can make it do whatever we want it's just code so as long as we agree that this is the right thing to do we can just do it it's this easy and we're i mean curl is the result of a community and the, the wishes of a community and we go forward to where we want it to go and uh, we have the luxury in the curl project that we are completely independent we don't we don't go by anyone's rules right we're not owned by a project uh, a particular company we're not even in on in any umbrella organization or anything we can do whatever we want so you can certainly affect what's next for curl so 
I try to often to ask people and you're always welcome to tell me tell us what you think about whatever we're trying to do and whatever you want us to do because it's helpful we want we need to get everyone's well maybe not everyone's but as many people as man possible to get involved and, and tell us what's right and what's wrong so that we get more get correct get feedback for for sort of to take the decisions so you can certainly help and and, and affect them and, and change things for what's going forward and by that we are at the end i am at uh, three hours 38 minutes by my count and it's been it's been a while thank you for 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 enduring this and for listening uh, i know there's uh, plenty of people left in the chat at least so not everyone has died just yet so uh, any questions in the chat room did i did i forget any any important stuff did i stumble that I I don't see any questions but I'm going to just sit here and uh, mention I could go back to the beginning and say this was the mastering the curl command line session I didn't find too many typos I dis I detected that I had missed animation on a few slides but f that was fine I th I had a few typos I think but yeah all in all pretty good so um, this uh, was what I did get cram into this presentation uh, <laughs> yeah so there's this joke about uh, someone missing the beginning and asking if I could start over but uh, uh, of course I will make this available on YouTube uh, I'm going to stop the recording right now